So hi to everybody. How are you? Hi, hi. Elena. Hello. Hello. Ciao. Hi, hi. So we're a bit early. Minutes, um, but we are already streaming, so you're already online. <laughs> Thankfully, it worked. Let me also get my own uh, background. I see now that you've been fantastic with the background, so I should be uh, as well organized. Give me one second and I will be backgrounds. All right, here I am. And we're branded. Kumaran, thank you for being here. Um, I will introduce all the jury in three minutes when all the students will be in, all the faculty will be in. Do you want me to share the book till then? Yes. So this is just for entertainment. This is the research that we've been doing in the semester, but we're just gonna let it flip through while we wait for everybody to be here. So it's um, 2 p.m. Uh, in Los Angeles. I would like to officially start the review of the studio Rethink in Hyde. Thank you all for being here. I will have a small presentation of the studio and I will introduce uh, all our esteemed um, guests today. Um, a few thank you are in order. Um, so I am the faculty of this studio, which is a vertical studio at Slayer. And Kumaran, please say hi, has been hi. Uh, the assistant teacher for the class um, and has been incredible help for the work of the students. Today, you will see um, seven projects prepared by uh, 10 students. They're all vertical students. Um, meaning that they are at the last year of their degree at SIARC. So some of them are undergraduate, some are MR1, some are MR2. So you will see a mix from the entire school, across through the entire school. Uh, you're all here because you have something to do with this project. Uh, all of you have either been to our reviews, uh, like uh, UN Studio, uh, Stefan and Pietro, or because you have done a project for uh, the Seoul Biennale like we have. And so I thought, what a great opportunity to actually meet all the people that have been involved in the same project. I know that each of you have had a different take on this and it was just uh, irresistible for me to invite you because I'm sure that there is a lot to learn from each other. And we might cross path in September, 2021 in Seoul, but maybe we don't. So I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, invite you all. So. Uh, the names of the jurors today are the names of the jurors and the faculty that have been involved in the project all around the world. Um, now, let me uh, give a small presentation of um, what we 
decided to be, uh, the way in which we could approach uh, the theme of the Biennale that Dokimini Pierrot gave to all of us. Um, let me um, find a way to stream, to share my video. You guys see me? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. So the studio is called Rethinking Height. Um, and it came from the realization that uh, something happened to a very important apology for architects. Um, and that apology is um, the office tower. And what happened to it was COVID. Um, something that maybe people that are not from Los Angeles might not know, but whoever you know knows the project and is in Los Angeles really noticed is that um, LA US Bank, Henry Cobb's building, uh, was sold for $430 million to Silverstein Properties. This is basically a sale. It's, to, it's been sold to two thirds of the price that was uh, evaluated just one year ago. And Silverstein Properties probably is, is known to many of you because um, they've been involved in the World Trade Center reconstruction. And that came about because clearly over 20% of downtown Los Angeles high rise offices are actually empty and therefore they lost value. And there is also a question mark about when this will open again and when and what will happen to the tower, to the office tower typology. Even once post COVID people will go back to a semi-normal life, would that become um, still the typology to be in for development and how can architects work and think about it. And so the studio rethought the topology of the high rise, in particular the office tower in this age of coronavirus when tall buildings development are dropping in value. Um, the class is confronted with a very difficult task, which I think is reconciling two powerful and opposite forces. On one end, uh, the students have been asked to really answer the need for high density buildings in fast paced growing cities like the one of Los Angeles and even more the one that uh, we see now in other countries. Um, but on the other end, um, there is a something very well known to architects that is the impoverishment of the public realm that exists at the streets that separate the planes of the towers. And jointly, now the new risk of coronavirus when people basically do not want anymore to enter uh, an office space that has an elevator. And not to mention the fact that one has to go to work and therefore this high density transportation, public transportation system are in crisis. So contrary to the never ending global race to building the tallest skyscraper in the world, uh, you know, a race that this diagram uh, shows from you know, prehistoric time to today, uh, the studio argues that high rise typology might need to drop. So we're gonna take the opposite, uh, the opposite direction. And really the approach of the studio is that um, the tower should go beyond the trait of being solely rhetorical. And you know, this seemingly unescapable quality of the building to be an advertisement for itself, which usually is the hat and the top of the building, which creates an iconic project. Um, so more importantly than occupying a skyline, the class will invest in developing a new mobility, uh, in creating vibrant civic spaces and planning of a safe private and public space. And we'll consider facades at the top of the building uh, a place for design. Because the position of the studio is grounded in the fact that um, at last, uh, architecture is contingent on its physical context. And ultimately, tall buildings today, responsibility lies more on the weight they meet the ground, which is this, rather than uh, they meet the sky, which is this. And so we're gonna take the opposite approach and instead of uh, trying to cross the boundary of the sky, uh, try to figure out what happens actually if you think towards the ground. Um, a little less courses, all of you know all of this, uh, but for the people that are following us on the YouTube live stream, um, 
the Seoul Biennale in 2021, uh, the Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism has um, involved, I think 43 schools all around the world um, with a theme of rethinking the idea of, um, of buildings today. And um, the theme is called Crossroads, Building the Resilient City. Dominique Perrault is a general director of the Biennale and there are three curators, one of which is in charge of the academic project, let's say, which is Marc Brossa. Uh, the Biennale period will be from uh, September 11th to November 11, 2021. Dominique Perrault uh, gave to uh, all of us three, no, actually five crossroads um, that architects need to confront themselves with. And the students have selected the ones they really wanted to work with um, during the studio. In particular, um, I gave them exactly the US Bank Tower, uh, which is a project by Ender Kopp, as we mentioned, uh, that uh, has been sold uh, this summer at a two thirds of their price. And they have been asked the students to re redesign and rethink what a contemporary office building could and should be, if it should still be an office building solely. Um, and these are some of the plans and drawings of the original project of Henry Cobb, which by the way is a beautiful project still standing. I'm sure it will regain its value, but let's say that for the, uh, for the moment, that's the provocation that I gave to the students. Um, so in addition to um, the exhibition that will be hosted in the Biennale, as of you know, there will be a catalog um, and the work of the students will be exhibited in Seoul. Uh, the Today Jury, which is a phenomenal group of uh, individuals that have said yes to me, and they're in different time zones, and thank you for being here. Some of you, I know we're pushing the timeline here. Uh, for the first session is uh, Stefano Capranico. He is an associate architect and associate at UN Studio. Maybe if you say hi or wave your hand so that you can, can see you if you unmute yourself. Uh, you will go to the top and people will be able to see you. Uh, Juan Jose Castellanos. Hello. Hi, please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, he's assistant professor at Rice University School of Architecture and co-founder of XMAID GMBH. Uh, Odile Compagnon. Hello, yes, okay. she's faculty, hi, she's faculty at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, and she's the principal of Odil Companion Architects. Uh, Platon Isais, is a yes? Hello, nice hi. to see you all. Good to see you as well. Uh, he's the director of Projective Cities. Um, and Phil in architecture and urban design program at the Architectural Association. Are you calling us from London? Or yes, yes, London, London. Late. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, okay. Eric Reeder. Hi everyone. Hello. Nice Hi. Uh, faculty at UC Berkeley College of Environmental Design and founder of ERA, Eric Reeder Architects. So we're, we're, we're close by in California. Yeah, I'm just up the, just up the road. <laughs> yes. um, Davide Sacconi, hello. Hi. Good to see you. Director of the architectural program at Syracuse University in London. So you are also in London. I'm not actually, but I should. should <laughs> I'm in Brazil at want, the moment. We won't, we won't, tell, we won't tell anybody. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Pietro Scarpa, uh, as well, architect at UN Studio. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see you. Uh, welcome here. So the session two is many other people that I will, um, that you can read here and they will join us at four. And so I am now going to uh, stop sharing. Uh, welcome to Seoul. And I'm going to give the microphone to the students. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, good morning, afternoon and evening. I'm Carnation. I'm Toby. And today we will be presenting our project, uh, The Ghost in the Shell. All right, let me start sharing. Okay, so in Rethinking Height, this project questions the constructs and futures of contemporary urban societies. But before we further elaborate, 
Toby will briefly introduce our studio site to give everyone some background context. The project site for this studio is that of the current U.S. Bank Tower, the 73-story architectural icon of downtown Los Angeles. Designed by Henry Cobb and completed in 1989, the U.S. Bank Tower was formerly, and perhaps more famously, known as the Library Tower. This was in direct reference to the historic Los Angeles Central Library right across the street. The tower's developers, McGuire Thomas Partners agreed to finance the library renovation and the expansion, saving the library from uh, demonetization. In exchange, they got the tower's IRS and zoning credits, making the tower the tallest building in Los Angeles from 1986 to 2017. So downtown Los Angeles presents itself to us as a manifestation of the capitalistic tendencies that have driven our society up until now, with profit and productivity as king and the tower as its crowning glory. However, with smarter and faster technologies, we project the future to be one of a post-work world, where the productive capacities of our spaces and apparatus supersede and, and re fully replace the need for actual human work. The ethos, and the ethos of happiness and fulfillment then sees us its correlation with our productivity and may hinge onto less definitive and more qualitative pursuits. Come 2020, the sudden halt of normal with the pandemic threw us into a future that we thought was still to come. As previously ubiquitous economic and social operations cease and our home and work lives become less distinguishable. Hence, the act of retrofitting the U.S. bank tower is our attempt to capture what it means to live in a future that's already happening now. The gesture of extracting and creating the new shell from the tower's iconic facade presents new spatial and surface potential with the existing building. Additional floor area is created through extensions and proposed as green boys, community spaces, or both. Modularity is introduced into the existing open floor plans. This allows for flexible and layered program making within the tower, bringing an end to the monolithic office tower. The tower's is, uh, existing height is treated as an expensive surface for design uh, intervention, as, op as opposed to a single volume to be kept. Our facade design is a twist on the original tower facade as an analogy and gesture. The new shell is then broken up into panels of varying scales. Um, apertures are created where new floor extensions reach out, revealing the tower's original scan at certain fleeting angles and moments. Closer to the ground, the tower ground interface is interpreted as a spatial mass, blurring the notion of a definitive public-private boundary. Reaching out to embrace the vicinity, including the central library, the streetscape is activated as a whole mass. Three main circulatory rings are introduced to address mobility to and inside the tower, connecting two proposed roof gardens, a plaza, the existing bunker hill steps, the library and the tower. Here are also the two urban refuge proposals that we developed on the site for the Sobinali that has been integrated into our project. And further information about them can be found on our website. So when it comes to our greening strategies for the tower, we got rid of the first four floors of the existing tower to make it more open to the ground and to let the green spaces flow into the building. From the plaza, roof gardens, green extensions and urban farming collectives, green spaces weave through the tower at different levels and scales. When it comes to issues of safety and risk, new peripheral cores are introduced in addition to the tower's existing circulation cores. We aim to introduce an intelligent elevator system that will be used as accesses and egresses to the building. This elevator system can move horizontally and vertically Every elevator track has multiple elevators running at the same time to improve efficiency and maximum capacity. 
together with the automation of other essential services like parking and logistics, the typical reliance on the single core is dissipated. Ghost in the Shell is a project driven by both the admiration and the rejection of the tower icon and typology as we know it. Rethinking height is a way to challenge ourselves to invert and subvert the exclusive notion of the tower typologies crowning glory as its literal crown. To create may not mean to destroy, and a ghost of the past may also be the life within the present. We have also prepared an animation as a summary of our project, which we will leave playing as a background for the further queue, like if there are any questions to be asked. Let me just play it now. Yeah, so basically this video just um, summarizes all the ground that we have covered. So yeah, we just thought that it may be helpful to have an animated reminder to everyone. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carnation and Toby. Uh, if the jury wants, please feel free to tell us which part of the presentation you might want to look at again. And uh, in the chat, you can find also a website that is a comprehensive website with the work done by the students. So you will find maybe more than you wish to find. Um, but um, we can also drag you to uh, each project from the students. Uh, uh, I I have a question. Can you can you hear me, guys? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. Maybe I, I totally missed it in the presentation, but the program that you have inside it's uh, only offices, right? It's actually mixed use. I can open up. So, yeah. Ah, okay, that's why it was small. At least on my screen, it's quite small. Yeah. Can you please zoom in on the agenda? Yeah, thanks. Is, is, is this clear? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, okay. Now it's clear. <clears throat> So basically you have on the bottom part mainly the office retails, retails in between the office and the residential part. And then mm -hmm. the, the central part of the tower is all residential. For the, the central top, right? for the central part of the tower, some parts are mixed office and residential, and the top part is mainly residential. Yeah. Okay. 
And on the crown, yeah, yeah. what do you have? Sorry? On, on the crown, on the top of the building. On the crown, we, we are proposing one, uh, one part to be like a more centralized urban farming collective, as well as to introduce some of the, well, I won't say introduce, but more of to retain some of the, the retail and commercial aspects of the top levels. Because um, in the existing typology now, the top part has already been developed into like a viewing platform of the whole Los Angeles, if I'm not wrong, as well as like a, like a very nice restaurant space and so on. So we thought that we would like to keep it to keep the programs more varied throughout the tower. Okay. I, I wonder if you might take this one step further. I hope I'm not interrupting anybody, but your project makes me think about ownership. And I almost imagine rather than, uh, you know, we think of the, you know, the typical tower having a, a single owner or, or a kind of corporate body ownership. Mm -hmm. But what if the tower were um, what if you could go in and you could buy a slice of land or a slice of area? And, and the outcome of that would be quite different in terms of um, individual, the, the ability of the individual to um, manage their own space, but also kind of maybe redress um, what's on the outside internally. And then I think you're kind of imagining a completely new, um, both not just expression, but public interaction and how, and I'm, I'm, com I'm commenting on this because as we look at this kind of programmatic intention here, that's still somewhat, I see it as being somewhat regular, but the outside, the skin projection is something that's so much more varied. And so it makes me think of, again, a kind of approach to individual ownership that could really kind of reposition what the tower type is. For me, that's really fascinating. Yeah, um, in response to that, to your comment, I've actually like seen real life examples of the, well, the way I, I think the way I, I learned about it is what we call like strata title um, developments where the shop owners, they actually own the shop space that they operate in within a building. So, I mean, in real life, I've seen a couple of those examples like from the late 70s, 80s, but I actually haven't seen one that's like entirely reflected on the facade. So I'm, I'm, kind, I'm also curious as to like how that will turn out. Yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Uh, no, you go ahead. No, no, please, please. No, you go. You can go first. Okay. Uh, well, I have a more, let's say, fundamental question about the the tower itself, because my understanding is that studio is proposing a re-evaluation of the typology of, a, of, the, of the tower. Uh, and I think in your presentation, you were mentioning something like the rejection of the tower as an icon or, or something similar. Uh, I would like to know if you could explain a bit better your position in this. I mean, how are you re-evaluating in your specific proposal, this idea of the tower and, and this idea of the icon? Okay, I think I'll start first. So when we first, um, like the kind of undercurrent that goes on behind that statement for us, it like from the very beginning when we first received this brief, our, uh, our outlook to this whole project is the idea that like the tower, the tower for several decades has always been an icon of progress. It's been an icon of like the newness, the, the fashion, the trend, you know, it's the forefront of, it's, it's a status, it's like a trophy for cities that want to prove that they are getting somewhere. And so the idea of selling the US bank tower to us, it seems like it's just going to pave way for another tearing down of just another building and, you know, constructing another, I don't know, world tallest building or the next new shiny building. And the way Toby and I, we saw is, could we possibly have a new so-called icon, but 
without actually destroying everything that was beforehand. I mean, I think it started off more as a design exercise, but as we progressed along the way, we felt that um, that was something that we were really looking into. So when we said we both have the admiration and the rejection of the tower as an icon, we meant we were, we are, I think we are thinking about the icon more as like a, it's, it's more of like a concept as opposed to the actual like physical mass itself. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I hope that answers your question, but Toby, do you have anything further to add on? Uh, yeah, um, at the beginning, we were imagining about if we just uh, turn this building down and build a new one, uh, that's actually the easy, easiest thing to do. Um, but the building also keep the memory, a piece of the memory of the city and the history of the city. Um, we kind of want to try to keep it. And we're, we're during this post pandemic time. Um, and our proposal is to how can we solve the problem we, we are facing during this time uh, without destroying the building itself, um, like functionally and also um, formally. Um, that's kind of our um, initial idea uh, to start with this object. Um, uh, yeah. Well, no, I think I think it's interesting uh, because somehow I think you are trying to 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 have a position, but somehow you are fascinated, and at the same time you are trying to, to reevaluate this idea of the icon. It's not very clear to me what is the exact position. I mean, what is the, but it's, it's actually very interesting, the, the proposal itself. Maybe it's, maybe it's a kind of another question, a bit the, the reflection on the, the idea of the icon. Somehow, because what I feel is that even when you are describing the, the, the tower, you, you describe it as an object, you say the object, uh, uh, which, which has this kind of, kind of a sculptural um, let's say um, connotation, uh, and I think it's evident in your in your drawings that that this kind of iconic value <laughs> prevails somehow, uh, regardless of the of the quality of it. I think this image, for example, of the facade, uh, to me is is really interesting. It's intriguing, um, but and, and actually I would like to know also <laughs> this idea of the pixelation that maybe maybe you can find something similar in the in the tower, the Agbak Tower by Jean Nouvel in Barcelona, this kind of pixelated nature of this kind of um, transparent, translucent facade that in the case of Nouvel is also almost like adding some kind of information with light at night and, and, and something. Like. And I'm interested about this performative part of the, of the facade. I would like to know a bit more what kind of, um, let's say, uh, parameters are behind the, the kind of, uh, material and, and geometric expression of this pixelation, this different distribution of pixels at different scales uh, and the space that is generated in between the facade and, and, the, and, the, and the existing building. So um, I have a, a question about um, the, uh, the safety and risk I'm looking at the website to try to to understand better, but I I'm not quite clear how how your building is is dealing with this issue of safety and risk. And by the way, you know your your drawings are are amazing. It's the the scheme is is really clear, and I I commend you for for that. But I I, I have this question about yeah, what's the risk and and how safe or unsafe is this making you feel? Um, so what is unsafe is um, because our start point is uh, we are in the this pandemic time and, and the number of the elevator is not enough for people to use it uh, while keep social distance. So we introduced this new elevator system 
uh, which already been invented by a German company. Um, that elevator will can move both uh, horizontally and vertically. It will increase um, um, the efficiency. Um, so people will have have more, um, let's say, people, um, people can go to their home more efficiently without waiting in the lobby. Um, so the circulation is the main uh, trouble we are trying to solve. Um, mm -hmm. And for other risk is like um, how the building be the ground, how you deal with the relationship um, with the building around and how people will get into the building, um, how, the, how the parking system work uh, with the elevator system. And, and that's also where we were thinking about. Um, so we introduced the three circulation ring for people to um, access the building as you can see in the blue part. Um, and we, um, so overall, we, want to, uh, we, we wanted to create a, a system as a whole um, to, to, to solve the problem that we are facing um, during this pandemic time. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I like the idea of, of this connection with the ground as a, as a way to address, you know, safety and, and sense of, of danger. I would, I think it's, it's great in your, in your answer was, was kind of convincing, but now I'm looking at the section and I, I would love to see that even better and how those rings are actually creating this safe space somehow. Can I can I follow up? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, I think I, mean, I think you're doing some things that are really really interesting. So one thing is this uh, new circulation diagram, right? So you, which is implies also a typological transformation of how the tower works, right? So it's, it happens on the ground floor and on the plinth with these uh, loops, right? And then with this ele new elevator system that you are proposing. Um, I, I'm just, so I, I, I think in, in the plan, the section and the, in the kind of three dimensional organization of, of the tower, you're actually very, very, very radical and very, they're pushing it to the limits in a way, right? It's it's an incredible, difficult, incredibly difficult project to do anyway, right? To to imagine uh, introducing an entirely new circulation diagram in a in a high rise building. Um, the thing that to me is not clear is why then you need to. I mean, to me, that's the theme of the project, and then the the new facade to me is, is somehow unjustified. So uh, I, 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 I kind of somehow wanted to see more of that and all the conflicts and the problems that would emerge from that very, very strong and very, very complex decision. Uh, and in a way, that's, that's what I, I kind of miss. Uh, I, I, all the, 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 the problems and the conflicts that emerge from this very, very um, interesting position, right? Because for example, uh, you're proposing a, a, a very radical transformation of the kind of programmatic diagram of the tower as well, right? Then I would expect to see then how the vertical circulation works. Because if you have a series of office spaces or spaces that are accessibly accessible more than residential, let's say, quarters of the tower, then this has implications with the circulation diagram, for example. Because some, I guess some elevators or some uh, staircases are more or less public, right? So that's for me the, the the question mark, right? Why you felt the need to somehow wrap it uh, again with a new facade and you're not exposing us all this complexity. That's for me the, the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of challenge in a way of the, of the brief. 
Can I so can I only add a detail to what you Platon said now? Because I, I was thinking uh, exactly the same that uh, or slightly the same, let's say almost the same. Uh, what I was very interested about is that you show the diagram of the building without the facade, and you mm -hmm. also show um, this twisting of green uh, terraces uh, around the whole uh, building. No? That I found very, very interesting, but then suddenly they disappear with the facade. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I think the facade, it's uh, amazing. It's really beautiful. I really like these uh, patches and this way of, uh, of also uh, to, to relate with, with what uh, Eric said, the sense of ownership that you can almost, you know, buy and uh, customize the facade that you want uh, in, in your apartment. So I think that the facade is extremely interesting, but also this diagram, it was very, very interesting. And in the moment that you cover it with a, let's say also a different design language that is uh, through, through the facade design, I was wondering uh, how the two things can uh, come together. Uh, because it can be very interesting to say, look, the title of the project is the ghost in the shell. So it can be something that you discover only after you step in the building and this could be also very fascinating that from outside you have a, pers a perspective of the, of the building, but then you come inside and you have a different one. Mm -hmm. Or, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, just to, to follow up with what uh, Platon said, mm -hmm. if, if you can just explain also a bit more the relation between these two uh, levels uh, of the inner and outer facade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with regards to the new extension, like the expansion of the floor plan, as well as the introduction of the new facade. Um, the kind of idea we had, because like when we thought of doing the new skin, so to begin with, the project was developed more from inside towards the outside. So initially we started off with the expansion of the floor plates, et cetera. And when the, the way we saw it is that with the introduction of the new skin, it kind of brings like a new spatial dimension to the, to the additional spaces that we already created. Because um, to us, like just introducing these winding green balconies around the building itself, like as an idea, we liked it, but we felt that there is more that can be expressed um, with the new skin. So, like the, to be honest, the skin, it, the way we saw the skin, it's, it's a view for this so-called goals that we made of the US Bank Tower. So the idea of the skin is to conceal and just at certain moments, certain angles, certain times of the day, it reveals what's inside. And that's, I, I mean, that's kind of more of a statement that we're making from a conceptual from like our conceptual uh, development. And so that kind of, I mean, I hope that explains how we interface our additional spaces and the new skin, yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe then it would have been good to maybe show it as, you know, the, the, the difference between the night view and the day view is not maybe um, dramatic enough and maybe there there is more transparency at night and we can actually see the ghost or something so that that there is this this difference when the building is lit and when the building is dark or ha is lit from outside from the from the sun or from inside from the the occupants I think actually this is a beautiful comment Odil. I I think uh, we might have not thought of that, but it's a phenomenal way to think about the skin. Um, and um, so thank you so much, Toby and Carnation, for opening up uh, the jury mm -hmm. a difficult project. Thank you. Job, and you had an answer for every question. And thank you so much. And we're going to move now to Ilaria. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Okay, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So thank you for being here. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. I'm going to uh, present uh, the project Reherb. Um, so living in a city today incorporates. Oh, oh Laria, could you move yeah. your things that are blocking the screen? Which one? The windows blocking your screen. Uh, you you can see the PDF. We see gray boxes. Oh, really? Wait a second. What about now? Black boxes. Gloria, it's your um, it's your window that has all of our faces on it. It blacks out that, so you just have to close that window. Now? Yeah, you have to close the window on the right-hand side with all of our faces. Like this? Yeah. So can you see the PDF? I, I can see it. OK. Yep. All right. So um, uh, I'm going to present the project uh, Reherbs. Uh, living in a city today incorporates the three high concepts, high pressure, high density, and high rise. As the population uh, sees a dense concentration, the city needs to adapt its shape by growing vertically uh, instead of horizontally. By taking in consideration of the living condition in the city, um, the project is uh, constructed on the base of providing an alternative life and at the same time um, find a way to better adapt the building to COVID-19 pandemic uh, emergency as the social distancing is one of the most demanded um, prevention. So firstly, uh, the project intends to dissolve the density by uh, reducing the flow number from 73 to 42, open up the enclosure and increase uh, the green areas. It includes, um, it includes uh, private residences, uh, retail and offices. The multifunctionality of the building is also interpreted through an um, explicit expression of a form, meaning to be read. And this is um, altering the um, code and the mysterious appearance that um, skyscrapers usually have. Thanks to the new height and the spatial quality, floors are able to uh, host from four to six single family houses and the two, um, and the green areas at the two sides. The structural core um, is developed along the building. Um, its shape allows the elevator to be distributed linearly. The elevator op operates um, as a two integrated group. Um, in order to uh, minimize the contact uh, with the with the neighbors, as you can see in this diagram, uh, I highlighted I highlighted with two colors. So whenever one is open, one is functioning; the opposite one is closed, and so on. Um, and the other um, the other important element of the concept is the vegetation. Together with the facade system, it creates an um, intimate and a greener environment for the inhabitants. So what the project brings to the discussion is how skyscrapers can continue their life cycle and it challenges the combination of the two uh, different realities. 
uh, city and the village and making the American dream achievable again. Thank you. I'm going to share um, a very short clip of the elevation pad, if you guys can see it. No. It's gray. It's gray. If it's on the website, maybe we can share from the website. Um, it's not on the website. Let's see it. I think we lost Ilaria. She's also gray now. I know, I know. Um, you know, that's she's in Italy. That's the Wi-Fi in my own country. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Gray is taking Italy. <laughs> ben, maybe, maybe Kumaran, do you want to share the website and we just scroll through Ilaria's work in, on the website, meanwhile, while she tries to come back so that people can formulate a thought. Thank you. Do you know what, which one of the um, biennial uh, team she was uh, using with, with her building? When, what, uh, which crossroad was she, was she? I think all the students um, had to respond to three, above and below, nature and artificial and safety and risk. Okay. I, for her case was more nature and artificial, given that she was working with the idea of the high rise topology mixed with the village and somehow lowering the density of, um, of the high rise, but still giving the location in the middle of the center of, of downtown and leveraging mm -hmm. uh, a different density towards the, you know, the American dream of a single family home with a picket fence. I think that's somehow the hidden, uh, the hidden agenda behind the dream here is that could uh, the, the skyscraper still exist, but with a lower density. And if that's the case, what would that allow to do? Mm -hmm. Also, this conversation is recorded, so I think you can maybe start the, the conversation and Ilaria will join us when, when she's able to. Okay. It's hard to tell from the drawing, but are the houses coming with the three-car garage? Hi, guys, I'm back. Hi. Okay, sounds good. So Ilaria, I'm gonna summarize for you. The question from Odile was, are the car coming with a three car, oh, sorry, are the houses coming with a three car garage? So I, I filled in for you the village slash uh, skyscraper and entertained the jury. So this one you have to answer. Do you have a garage in, in every home? Oh, uh, no, they don't have it. <laughs> I tried like uh, to really uh, have the complete service of um, a single family house, but for the garage, it's, um, it's difficult to, let's say, build a gar garage elevator to the, you know, 200 meter. So we're, where did I stop? Uh, don't, don't worry, they've seen the entire project. I think you can maybe share the, um, the animation if you would like to. And meanwhile, while you were gone, we showed your website. So, and we had some conversation and I filled in for you and answered a few questions. Hopefully uh, that was not too dangerous for you. I think the All right. Is going. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the clip, a uh, very short clip of the facade. If you guys can see it. It's gone back to gray, so we can't really see it. 
Uh, okay. Look, it's okay. Don't worry, Laria. Just, yes, I think, you know, just scroll with your mouse is okay. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not the end of it. So let, let's maybe start the discussion without showing more. And maybe, uh, Kumran, do you want to show the website? So we continue with the website. So you will, you will share now for Ilaria. And Ilaria, you can tell us where to go. Ilaria, I have two questions if I can um, enter in. Like, um, can you elaborate a little, bit, a little bit more about whether the facades in the parts that are, let's say, more open, if they are enclosed or not? Uh, and what is actually the relationship with the ground? Since it seems quite an important aspect as your uh, your tower seems to acquire some kind of landscape, landscape quality. So can you elaborate a little bit more about the relationship with the ground? Uh, so as you can see in, um, in this um, view of the building, the ground will remain um, for office uses. So it will, they will have a, a very uh, a common hall for both um, offices and the residences. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, and the other thing is if in between the spaces that are more boxy, let's say, if those spaces where are the, can we call them villas, let's say, are you thinking them as open air or what is really the quality of that? Um, enclosure is it the grid is it the glass is it are we do we have to think them more as a uh, greenhouses let's say or is it open to wind and rain and so on and so forth so come see if you can scroll down there is a one render that shows from inside to the outside yeah let's say uh, the materiality of the houses are it's been like a really headache for me. I, uh, it's a really challenging, like, I don't know what's the best solution for, for it. Um, also, when, whenever um, you are dealing with the independent element, like the, the single family houses, the question, um, it re writes, raises the question, whether it needs another skin or not. Um, so um, in order to have a more uh, pri uh, privacy and also uh, prevent it from wind and also like the sun, I chose to uh, create an facade, especially where the houses are. Uh, this is why you can see from the elevation uh, where the facades uh, cover up. Uh, it's where where the uh, residences are. Yeah, following David's question. Uh, I mean, I find very uh, provocative this idea of the village inside the tower, uh, um, but, uh, but it's raising quite uh, also interesting questions in my opinion, like for example, what is the idea of community or public space that you relate, because you are, you are somehow generating multiple plinths and towers, and this is a, a topic of the, of the studio that in your case you repeat uh, let's say in, in multiple modules that are pile up one on top of the other, and you generate this kind of um, a space in between again, but it's a space that uh, I don't know if it's private, if it's public. I mean, I would be interested about the kind of um, concept that you have in terms of the, the community or the, the, these spaces that are generated in between these houses. And then my second question would be, the scale, the question of the scale, because somehow you are you are uh, integrating houses inside the <laughs> existing building in your image, in this kind of perspective that you have now or before from the interior, 
it seems that it, you would need something like 10 meters of free space be between the, the from slab to slab. Um, uh, so I would like also to ask how are you how are you solving this or how are you addressing these questions? Uh, so the floors for the single family houses is uh, um, it corresponds to four original floors. Um, uh, so uh, the, to answer the question about community, um, so in the in the um, in the concept, also um, mentioning the organization of the connections, so the the elevators. So it's meant to be um, separate, actually. Also to respond to the pandemic issue. Um, so as I mentioned before, the two integrated um, elevator groups, each elevator will bring uh, the inhabitant directly to their house. So they will never reach the hall um, unless it's a, a, an emergency case like a, the fire or anything else and then uh, between the houses so when they reach the houses uh, there there are no divisions so there are no uh, separations between the houses so they if they want to they can choose to uh, separate or integrate with their um, their neighbors it's up to the inhabitants, but the, the project itself, it's meant to be separate. And, and sorry, another question I had was about the process. How do you think this can happen? Meaning part of the American dream is that you can fully customize your house, that you potentially self-build your house, uh, that you have full control on your property let's say. Uh, I mean, of course, it's not really the case, uh, but that's the tendency, if you want, or the ideal, no? that it's basically you and nature. Uh, and so I think it would be interesting to understand how you thought, how you can bring, for example, construction material up and down, or how do you think that um, a certain autonomy of each plot is allowed? So also in um, former, uh, the previous project, uh, some of you mentioned the ownership. I think it applies to this project as well. Um, um, so the owners, uh, the buyers, uh, they can, uh, if they are interested in certain uh, piece of this land, they can, they can just uh, buy it and uh, maybe um, within some of these uh, limitations, uh, restrictions they can build their house as they like and uh, to have vegetation or not like what kind of the, what kind of vegetation and uh, what kind of uh, um, roof let's say it's all up to the creativity of the owner and um, the technical issue I um, um, in the, oh, there's a no floor plan in the website. Uh, so in the website, you can see there's uh, um, like the elevator for furniture. It's uh, like a, a double or triple bigger than the, than the regular elevator. Uh, I, I don't know if that actually solved the problem. Um, as um, it like the building the houses, it comes to uh, it comes along along the time like along the way they they just don't build them all all of a sudden like all in the all in once. Um, so I don't know if they actually can use the um, glue. Is that the word? <laughs> Or crane, can, crane. Okay, crane, yeah. <laughs> All the elevator, uh, the furniture elevators enough. Like, 
uh, for this one, uh, I actually like, I hope the elevator is enough. <laughs> I, I wanted to comment on um, this notion of what is, I think was described early in the project or the presentation about a kind of reverse density or um, removing density from the tower, which seems really interesting. But I think from my perspective, you're actually um, interrogating in a really interesting way, um, the notion of density in Los Angeles. And you're, in fact, I, I think you're densifying Los Angeles by such uh, proposition. And, and in that respect, I find it to be incredibly contextual or relevant in, 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 in thinking about LA, which is such an, in my, you know, I think in most opinions or in, in reality, it's such a non-dense place. Um, and for me, that's really quite fascinating. Um, and I also, just as a quick question, was wondering, I appreciate the preservation of, of um, some of the layers of the existing tower, I'm, I'm not a preservationist, but I think there was a, a real specific reason for doing that. And I, I missed it in the, in the presentation. And I like that about the, the proposal. Maybe you could speak to that for just a second. Um, so we were, um, uh, as usual, um, how city grows, it's, like they they intend to be bigger and uh, more dense and uh, more people in it so like um so in order to respond to this uh point uh and also um just to have a piece of land in this uh in the downtown la uh, that people can still like feel because I, I, I come from Europe and there's a lot of greenness here. Uh, when I got there, I, after months, I was, I felt like a really weird not seeing a single tree or garden or park. And so also from this perspective, I was wondering like what I can, if I can have, um, like a sort of a park-ish or garden-ish place in downtown LA. Um, and also to see like um, just tiny houses, not skyscrapers, you know. Um, this is a very like kind of personal. Um, yeah, this is why I chose the project to be called reurbs, like it's a reurbaning inside the uh, central city. Thank you, Ilaria, for um, the recap on the project. I think um, it was great to see um, this idea that it was a personal idea, but somehow I think has many typological implication. We're moving now to the next team, Jesse and Tony. Hi, uh, my name is Tony, and this is my partner, Jesse. Hi, my name is Jesse, yeah. Okay, so the open four plans are commonly used typology in most high-rise projects. It brings flexibility of space arrangement to users and foster interactions between different people. However, with the increasing concern of people's privacy, both at home and work, along with the ongoing pandemic, people are looking more towards to a smaller enclosed space to work and to live. Our proposal, Cluster Community, brings up an idea of modular typo typology that provides a safe enclosed space while maintaining the flexibility of space arrangement inside the high rise. In contrast with most office program in the original US Bank Tower, Cluster Community mainly consists of residential programs. Nowadays, our home plays a more crucial role in our everyday lives, as we are spending more time and doing more activities in our home than before. Apart from residential, the tower also provides amenities, public community, and outdoor space throughout the entire building. 
Different from the singular core, the new tower provides multiple core and distributes users into smaller groups and further reduces the risk of cross-contamination. Inside each core, we propose a cable elevator system that is able to carry multiple elevators inside a single shaft, hence increase the efficiency of the building mobility and reduce the number of people inside each elevator to a minimum. Parallel to the elevator course, the egress also locates at every branch of the core. This reduces the capacity per staircase and shortens the travel distance to the nearest exit. The tower consists of 24 different modules that varies in different shapes, size, and programs. The variations show flexibility of space arrangement to different user groups, while on the other hand, it creates almost infinite possibilities of module arrangements. The shape of the form differentiates on the 12 by 12 foot sides, applying with the curved edges and retaining the profile of the pitch roof in order to create a sense of unexpected juxtaposition between the traditional housing and the high-risk topology. The module layout breaks large, open, and centralized public space into small, decentralized, and enclosed community spaces, which populate throughout the building. These community spaces are more private, closer to the residential units, and significantly reduce the course contamination between different groups of people. Each chunk is assembled with these desultory forms regarding the needs of the program associations and results in aggregated, aggreg uh, aggregated organizations based on performance. Chunks are formed into two different sizes intentionally to differentiate properties and characters. In these two assembled parts, beside the residential and the townhouse, they also contain retails and commercial programs in order to meet user needs. And we see that as a neighborhood with all amenities. The two smaller chunks are wrapped around with the staircases, which provides the diagonal circulation of the entire tower. The site re re and the site retains a 51 feet vertical displacement. And with uh, echoing topology of certain site, we proposed an elevator con uh, ground condition and shifted the main lobby onto the upper level, which connect to the back of the site in order to create a certain level of privacy for the user. In addition, we, dis uh, we pl um, plan the ground level with small retails and bicycle hubs becoming a social gathering space for public. The left is the main lobby, beside the retail and commercial space, along with indoor gym and swimming pool. The right is the patio plan, is the main connection of the three towers and also contains the entire level of outdoor amenities, such as swimming pool, dog park, basketball court, which is located at the junction of the main body and parking. This is a plan cutting through the residential community space and collaborate office, which shows the module just the positions and program associations. In contrast, in contrast to the ubiquitous open floor plan, it forms by three in, in independent tower system and diagonal interaction and provide a direct as, uh, access from elevator to units. The facade is constructed with louver panels and extend window structure in order to blur the reading of inner module and give a sense of unity. Toward the section, we chose the technique of step cuts in order to show the module adjacency, core system, and diagonal circulation of the tower simultaneously. Continuing the idea of modular design, we further developed two refugees. Adapt to the issue of stray animal and affordable housing. We also, uh, also they also working as facilities inside of the tower. Nowadays, people's walking standard has been gradually shifted from physical to, digi to digital. And um, also amid the COVID, the idea of modern city has been proven social and sustainable. 
the result of the operation system is in response to the global crisis and intend to speculate its effectiveness in mega metropolis beyond Los Angeles. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tony. I have a, a, a question um, just to make sure. So there, there seems to be like an open space between the three cores. Is that, how does that work? And you can see on like on the floor plan, what's like the center of the, of the, the building? Here, this gray part in the middle, how, does that, uh, this this is just a void between the two Three. modules. Okay. Attached to different cores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a function to this void? What what is it? What is it doing? Uh, actually, it's not it seems like it's creating an interesting interior facade. Also, that I'd be curious to see in section, for example. Yeah, and the, 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 yeah, that's the void creating by the tower as the adjacency part, and it's not applied with the, any program between them. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, congrats. First of all, congratulations for the, for the beautiful images and the really careful mm -hmm. uh, craftsmanship to produce all these, all these beautiful perspectives and drawings and, and diagrams. I think it's really nicely done. I think there are a couple of questions that, that to me are also, it would be interesting to maybe develop further. I think something that is very successful in my opinion is when you are explaining the, let's say the individual clusters and you are using three-dimensional diagrams to show this aggregation. You are showing because actually you are connecting different levels and I think this is adding quite a, a level of richness that, that somehow you lose when you, are, when you are explaining the tower itself, that you are explaining more in a more classical way with the plants and then, uh, and then but there are other questions that could be addressed in the plants. But to me, there is something nice in this kind of three-dimensional uh, representation of these clusters that somehow you lose when you start explaining uh, each, let's say, each plan, like like in layers. I think probably there would be a chance to explain the whole, uh, let's say, articulation of the clusters in a bigger, let's say, in a bigger scale. And it would be prof probably more uh, easier to understand because in a plan, somehow mm -hmm. uh, you lose this kind of uh, three-dimensionality that you, that you are, um, let's say, incorporating in the development of these clusters that to me are really nice and, and rich. Um, and then the other question or, or comment is, is more related to this idea of the, the emptiness of the building, no? because you are talking about the community, you are talking about how people are generating these kind of interactions, but there are no, no people at all. I mean, you don't see any single person in the, in the building, it's like an empty building with no, nobody. And I think there would be a chance maybe to, because the, the images are very nice and, and you could even imagine what kind of things could happen inside, but without, let, let's say, people inside the scale, the human scale, and, and let's say the, the inhabitation of these spaces, probably, again, you lose a bit the, the potential to imagine how these uh, interesting clusters could be, could be alive. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, because we're um, yeah we're doing the sections with the people inside, but yeah, um, if you can see that, that's really tiny. Yeah, because <laughs> we met. Imagine it's kind of because um, uh, echoing to the problem of COVID nineteen. So we think um, this project can uh, contains uh, certain privacy between each modules and also um, 
uh, like provide the living needs for people, like daily needs for the, like you don't need to leave the tower and you get everything you need, that's it, yeah. Yeah, I, I would also uh, like to say that um, as Juan already mentioned, the quality and the details of the drawings I mean, are really, are really amazing, I have to say. <clears throat> are a very, very high standard that you guys uh, have produced in basically all the images. Uh, and that said, um, I, I have a comment because I remember very well this project when you showed during the midterms uh, review. Also the facade, I remember was quite uh, different. The upper part of the facade was very different with a gradient from red to blue, if I remember correctly. And the bottom part was basically empty there was just the two cores or the core uh, to the ground and that's it <clears throat> so i think there is a, a very uh, big huge uh, development that you guys did the only thing that the, the difference between the other projects that we've seen so far is that somehow the others always uh, used uh, the footprint or some elements from the existing building this one uh, I mean, for me, is, I was trying to, to, to search, to look for anything that is somehow related to the existing building. And for me, this is, is I mean, it's not a renovation, it's just uh, a demolition of the previous one and, and you rebuild on top of the, of the, same, uh, of the same ground. At least I don't see the relation between the floor, any floor plans or the core position. It's like a totally, a totally new project, totally, totally new. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I would like to, 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 to ask you if maybe I missed something and there is actually a relation with the previous one or if it was indeed on purpose to really like uh, start from a blank page and, uh, and uh, design this, uh, this building. Sorry, if I can add on this, because I think it's a really good point is, maybe you can define what is your context in a way, or how do you understand context, uh, building on, on what Stefano was exactly saying. So our idea like demo, like, uh, that's a good point, like um, why we chose to demo crash the old floor plan. Because uh, to our, we did research like for the last centuries, the open floor plan is kind of popularized among the tower project. And then uh, also because of the, the saturations right now, we, we want to kind of uh, doing a change and doing something like in contrast of these kind of ubiquitous open floor plan. So we break up these, um, the, the like the open floor plan and like main core system and into three, like three individual system. And then with um, make the whole thing into a, give a sense of unity by the facade system, yeah. Uh, can I can I jump in? Is that... uh, to me, there is something really fascinating in this project. It has to do with the cluster as a as a typological uh, category, right? And I think what you just said to me is really really uh, fascinating, right? So the the transformation from an open plan to a cluster organization. But I think to me, what is really somehow a bit unclear is what how does the cluster is being. Uh, uh, somehow is evolving in the in in, in the plan or in the, in the in the organization of this new scheme, right? So the cluster requires a couple of things, right? So uh, it's a basic unit or the way the unit is you know able to to, to create clusters. So or, or uh, the structural system, for example, seems to me, and and you have some of that in the plan. So you some you know we can see a. You know the struggle of adapting or changing or adding a, a new structural model, right? But somehow, what to me is not very clear is the let's say the the, the rhythm or the, the the way the cluster as a as a as a typology as a as a form as well uh, evolves. 
So it's it's I mean even in this plan, you know, you 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 see the intentions, but somehow it's it's not very it's not as clear as someone would expect. Or what is not very clear is also how the different systems come together. So the open plan and the cluster organization, or the structural system of the open plan and the structural system of the cluster organization. For me, I would love to see more of this kind of, again, kind of conflict between these two different systems, because the idea is really, I mean, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, a yeah, maybe here, right? So it, it, it needs more of this kind of process diagrams, maybe, or like f formal and structural diagrams of how these, these things uh, come together. Yeah, so we basically change the idea of open for open space into a different small module space that has different program and then by simply placing uh, next to each other. And this creates like a different results, for example, uh, like a housing on top of a community space or, or like next to a gym or something. And uh, like when we're cutting through the different plans, it, it creates like a, all different kinds of juxtaposition of spaces next to each other. And I, I understand this. I mean, for example, but if you see Ricardo Bofil's plans that are you know based on these cellular systems, you're able to read uh, very clearly what is the cell, what is the unit, how the units come together, what is the logic of of the clustering, somehow the blue elements that you have, which are very, very interesting, they, they kind of remain as blue ghosts somehow. I mean, I don't, I don't see how they grow. I don't see how they connect well with the, with the rest. That's what I'm saying. I, probably it needs a bit of work. Go back to these axles and just look again on the plan and the axle of these moments of, of, uh, of, uh, that the systems come together and just you know, be a bit more you know, speculative or, or try a few different possibilities or show how you know different structures come together. I mean that's that's all. That's what I'm saying. I think probably this is this is related with the, the concept of how you articulate this cluster because I agree with, with, with Platon that somehow, and this is what I was trying to point out before, uh, there is actually a kind of um, potential to understand the, the tower as a continuum. I mean, somehow, to me, it's more related with the idea of the fold or uh, with some projects, I don't know, of uh, FOA in the 90s or, or dealers Cofidio, this idea of how from one unit to the other, even some images, they, they kind of remind me some of the projects by dealers Cofidio, the I-beam uh, competition uh, with this idea of that the, the floor basically folds and then it becomes uh, it connects different levels, and, and probably this idea of continuity is better expressed in the in the in the three dimensional drawings than in the in the plans. Where I agree that uh, it's kind of difficult to to understand not not only the the clusters because somehow I think what you are trying is to generate a, a continuum in the in the tower, but more how you articulate this cluster, the movement, somehow the, the circulation system. And maybe the, this would require another, another kind of um, uh, representation probably. Mm -hmm. I also agree with a lot of the comments about the representational success of the work. One thing that I would like to see though, or understand more of from the standpoint of understanding these nested aggregates and the residual effects of um, really the, what I see as the leftover result of placing the, the unit aggregates within the tower, um, because I feel like there's a reverberation and you it, the resulting um, kind of marginal spaces and um, a, kind of the, what I think of as the leftover, um, I, I think is really interesting and we would really like to understand it more, especially in the building section. Um, and this is something I don't necessarily need an answer now, but I think it's something for you to think about because um, this notion of nesting in the, I think the isolation or the safety that you're creating in the kind of 
COVIDian world that we're living in. Um, that's kind of how I understand it. But uh, there's, again, I think there's the potential for really kind of utilizing these residual moments within the tower um, to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's pr probably what I, I was kind of driving to when I was asking what the space was in the middle, mm -hmm. also in, in plan, and that would be interesting to, to develop. And But I think that one thing that really a bit deceiving when you see the the richness of everything that's in the, the clusters is is how the the tower touches the ground and I think that I mean I'm not sure it, it looks like parking and I feel like this is this is a bit um, tough I, I remember you explaining in plan that you were playing with two level differences but we don't see that in the section and it doesn't really show even on this um, elevation and so that I feel like it's a little um, weak compared to the composition of the rest of the building. The, um, the, this section is from the, fr in fr uh, the front of the street so it's mm -hmm. basically the same view as the elevation so uh, yeah uh, but you can slice it because we don't have the one like front back so you can mm -hmm. see there's a like a higher level um, to connect the back of this ground mm -hmm. and back of the side. Maybe you should have chosen that section instead. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Because then it would have been an elevation of that space between the two cluster that must mm -hmm. be really interesting. Yeah. The interior elevation. Yeah, congratulations, it's pretty cool. So thank you, um, Tony and uh, Jesse for the beautiful presentation. And I have to echo the fact that you have uh, constantly during all the semester put uh, an intensiveness and a precision in your project that uh, surpassed my expectations. So thank you for your presentation. And we're moving now to uh, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Cindy, and my project re-examined the height of the high rise. The project is 458 feet, uh, 142 meters tall, which is almost half of the original library tower. The new tower is not a skyscraper anymore, but instead a more chunkier mass with a focus on the ground. The original US Bank Tower was used as an office tower with a little public program for the new towers. Other programs like apartment, hotel, and retails were added to create a diverse connection in urban context. The original US Bank Tower has only one side walk, uh, side walk walkway called Bunker Hills on the ground. So I want to create a level of more interaction more below. Instead of just opening up a plaza level closer to the street, I introduced a middle ground between ground and top, which is a constantly circulating driveway with the pedestrian walkway. It is not only a middle ground between top and below, but also a middle ground between Fifth Street to the Hope Street, since this connection has always been ignored. I'm creating a new crossroads on the site and providing the platform for different mobility. The original US Bank Tower is a typical central core optimized planning tower. The new tower with a distributed core created more distinct connection for people to find directions. I think this type of circulation will be more needed in the post pandemic era. The connection bridge not only redefines the ground condition, but also shapes my project. The initial approach of the project is to open up the site from fifth to hope. So I create a deep cut in the middle of massing physically. This led to the single tower project having a dual qu a tower quality. For the facade, a new layer was added to enfold the massing, but leaving enough gap in between. This distance of gaps varies throughout the building. Sometimes it can be a double skin and sometimes it can be a kernel wall. Wherever the facade peel off the, from the original skin, greens and trees will be added. The facade is panelization with 5,331 metal panels. 
very uh, rotation perforation of the metal panels provide enough natural sunlight, even when the double skin is quite thick. Um, I want to introduce a middle ground of the city. By saying the middle ground, I mean the middle transition of various circulation direction, directions. I've already opened up the site from Fifth to, uh, fifth to Hope. Because the LA Public Library is right in, top, in front of the site, I also want to in, uh, create a middle ground of accessing that historical building. Not only is there a physical bridge connecting the two buildings, but also a part of the tower program is going to serve the library program for the coming uh, post-pandemic era. The tower created a new no ground plane in the city on this level. Uh, but instead of an openly, uh, open, freely moving plane, I'm creating a more designated path for circulation in the pandemic time. The, this tower is a dual tower. It's not a dual tower project, but because it's massing articulation, which is the deep cut in the middle, the space in the middle becomes the middle ground of different programs. This, uh, the space in between are never a regular rectangles. The walls are always shared toward one direction. I turn some middle ground into communal space and also do some direct chop. So the boundary of this middle ground in the plan, in the plan can be distinct and also weight. Besides the mobility plan below, I also create two other planes located at level 12 and level 25. It is like a new ground for the floors above. Those two plans uh, also redefines the facade panelization and the color schemes on the exterior. On this section, you can see the massing differences between the east and the west side of the building. The connection, also the connection from the tower to the library. The facade not, on, not always wrapping the towers. Sometimes it revolves the curtain wall behind, behind and it gives a space behind a breeze, so it's not always chaotic. Because my facade is a metal panels with st uh, steel structure, so it's not very solid, the plants uh, behind can, go, can grow through the gaps in between, and this adds a different vibe to the facade. Even this project is a high rise, residents will still have outdoor spaces since the project is not really tall. This mostly happens in the middle ground between the facade and the curtain wall. This render is showing the case for residential level. For the office le uh, level, the platforms are less separated. It became a new outdoor open communal spaces connecting people for the coming post pandemic era. And this perspective showing the, uh, the, 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 the plane that connect people and cars. And this is the uh, night perspective render and you can see even at the night, you can see through the facade. So I'm just going to share a animation. So the tower is not considered tall in the site. So it make, makes it less intimidating and more access friendly. It connects all directions of circulation on the site. It is the middle ground or crossroad of, of downtown LA. The panels rotations varies through the entire building, but it always follows the yellow panel. So there's a logic for the opening. Question. I, I don't know if you finish with the presentation. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I uh, I'm really having a hard time trying to understand uh, on the podium the connection with the library, especially as it is uh, is not only pedestrian. You also have. Uh, I mean, it looks like a, a street, not that. Uh, goes on top of the library in front of the plot of the building. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I saw this already happening in the first project. No, I think it was in the, also in the project called uh, Ghost in the Shed that there was a connection to the library. And uh, I see now coming back again, 
And uh, my question is, what is so important programmatically that we need to connect this building with the library uh, that is actually on the other side of the street? And uh, especially with not only a pedestrian connection like you have here, but a sort of street where the car can also access the library, if I understood correctly from your drawings. So I, I'm just uh, um, thinking what is so important and why we need to connect this building with a bridge that is not, again, not only pedestrian uh, to the library in, in front of it. And so programmatically, what is this uh, importance the importance between this connection? Uh, well, original plan for uh, setting uh, uh, setting up the bridge because I want to open uh, the site from a fit to hope. And while I, in the middle of the creating the, the the process of creating, I found out like it's also important because the the building is right in front of it, and why not just con uh, connect it and serve part of uh, put part of the program of the tower to serve the library because I did some research on like library in the pandemic area and some I saw like most librarians think it's really difficult and in like for people to uh, go into libraries and even before a pandemic and libraries like not not a lot of people to go there so they some librarians uh, discuss this and Maybe we need a uh, new forms of library and more open spaces, and I think that's the main purpose of connecting the libraries uh, to the tower. Yeah. Sorry, if I. Sorry. Sorry. And now I for Stefano that the the, the Eric Hop Tower was called the Library Tower. And now has been called U.S. Bank because of uh, you know the owner, but uh, w which I know, I mean from uh, I don't know him from him directly, but in general from friends of Harry, he was always uh, quite disappointed of the sign of U.S. Bank on, on the tower. So the library tower and the connection between the civic building and his tower was something that he also uh, was very keen to to keep. Okay. Okay. Stefano, just. No, no, no. I, I, I was just following up on the, on the same because now I mean it's clear, and I think uh, you made also a good point uh, on uh, why it's connected. But then, why with the car? Why should I access it with the car? Because then it would be enough to have a pedestrian bridge, or I mean, can be a bridge that is merely a connection, or can be a programmatic bridge where you can also have some outdoor activities related to the, to the library. I don't know, outdoor areas where you can read. So why, why you felt the need to, to make it accessible for the cars? Uh, uh, actually, I been while I'm thinking about the future of this project, I actually think about adding like more platforms on this bridge and for like uh, people gatherings. But at the same time, the studio is uh, exploring the building problem in the pandemic times. And I think we just, forced to stay in our car more times in uh, in this time. So I think it just makes more sense to have cars accessing the uh, uh, libraries while circulating the towers. Also, there's more, uh, like even now the libraries, some, some libraries are serving pickup or pickup reading points in re real life now. So yeah, that's why I bring the car to it. Like a drive in for books. Yeah. <laughs> like you pick up and drop drop the books over there. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your answer. I I really like this how you started. So it, you decided to have a shorter building, kind of to reduce the problem of the vertical circulation in the COVID uh, moment. And then you immediately realized having a solid and more dense mass because you're occupying more uh, of the plot. And then you did those nice, um, very gentle, interesting mass styling, which you decide to split it in two, in two, in two different volumes and even uh, vertically in, in different elements. 
and this, that space in between the, those two volume creates, it's, it seems like if I understand correct, that is your main entrance on the ground level. And I was wondering uh, how the grounds react to this very strong gesture of splitting the tower in two. Um, yes, the, the entrance is actually um, extension of this uh, metal cut. And right now it's just a simple open air move to, yeah, to access from the two sides of the tower and eventually emerge on top. Yeah, then I think it's a it's a great space. It would be a good opportunity to create a a nice uh, landscape, an intimate landscape. In, mm -hmm. in there. Then I also another question on this floor plan on the left. Yes. Um, what is that? There is only one element in all the drawing that I've seen that is diagonal, and is that core there on the left? What is that uh, element in the center? In the, in the middle. Yeah, in the middle of the floor plan on the left. Okay, so this plan is a resident, uh, is apartment plan. So it just when I created this plan, I found out like because this building, as you mentioned, is quite thick and it's like so it, the middle point become awkward moment, but at the same time, it's a lot to explore here. So right now, I haven't like really figured out, but those are just spaces left to like to fill the program in for the apartments. Yeah, I think that, that's also another important moment in which the two elements can come together with a, with a void, can extend through the, to, to the ground almost. I have a, a question about the skin. I actually have two questions. I'm not sure I understood right the, the color scheme, the choice of color. Yeah. And then also, what is exactly the, the role of that? Can, does it have like an environmental purpose and and um, in which case is it justified that it'd be the same on all four sides and yeah that that's yeah. my it's beautiful I really love it it's really a fantastic but I'm just wondering about the purpose okay the the skin uh, through the diagram as you can see it has three skins and well, the reason behind behind it is to differentiate it. Well, at the same time, I want to reinforce the massing. I don't want like just wrapping the uh, massing and people not seeing through it. Uh, like not seeing through, but like people have no idea what is happening behind it. So the facade is still following the shape of the massing, but more exaggerated, more peeling off, and while still showing the uh, inside. And so yeah, but. Um, I, so the color scheme also helps to uh, also like make 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 the massing more distinct. Like this part is like darker and this part is lighter to really see from the outside how many uh, elements in this tower. Yeah, and also mm -hmm. the different rotation pan, uh, perforation of the panels is just adding the uh, sunlight, natural sun, enough natural sunlight to see it. So. Even from the from the night render, you can even from the night when the with the, with the building light up, you can still see the curtain wall behind. Yeah, but the space between the building and the skin is 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 it outside? Is it open? Um, yeah, can we look at the section maybe? Is it is it so it's indoor or outdoor? It means the units don't have really access to windows, right? They yes. Just have uh, yes. Some some units don't have access to the windows because uh, it's just the nature of the geometry. But uh, most of the uh, plant uh, the plants will have uh, so the first first slab extended to reach out the facade. So uh, I want to utilize the space in between instead of just like empty spaces and all the all hollow spaces all the way down. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So the balcony is created, but it's not just like block block of balcony. Like people can people can still see, even people at the bottom of the floor can still see up. So 
there's enough uh, solar. I also introduced the nature element on this in this spaces where hydroponics and and also trees will be added to this part. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does that also fit some kind of study on how you know we link to the the pandemic and to the the circulation of, of viruses within the building or is yes, that uh, for sure because arrange in the original uh, even ap apartment like ap usually apartment you have a, like a lounge space in the middle of the uh, building so I want to move that program to the outside even though right now this render is showing separate balcony but at some levels balcony are connected and they're bigger and they're, they're outdoor so they're outdoor but with safety <laughs> protection so so uh, the the gathering space on um, uh, happening on the skin of the big tower instead of like in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting that somehow you are you are reevaluating the, the the idea of the of the tower by almost like deconstructing and reassembling the the the, the mass. I think it's an interesting strategy. But I think it has also a quite a strong impact in the occupation of the of the public space. Let's say the existing roads. The previous footprint is now I don't know the percentage, but quite significantly bigger. Uh, how how did you how how are you let's say um, compensating somehow this kind of reduction of the of the ground that there was before, comparing with the footprint that you have now? in the incorporation of these spaces, maybe in the building. And then maybe related to this, uh, the other question is the, the, the roof. I mean, you are producing a quite, uh, let's say, extensive uh, surface that is um, covering this, this, uh, this mass. And I don't know if you, if you thought about what would happen with this big surface that you, because the roof becomes also, uh, quite, uh, let's say, important in, in terms of the scale of it, but also in terms of even energetically speaking, in terms of the, I don't know, the, 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 the installations or the, the technical elements that you have or the potential activation of this surface as a public space. And so I would like to know more about these two questions. Okay. Um, for the roof, uh, this, First of all, uh, uh, we ha I haven't I haven't have like enough time to really develop the roof, but this studio is not it's more focused as also I present like I said this project also focused more to the middle ground between the uh, top and uh, below and top. So the roof is not like haven't fully developed yet, but I'm because right now, like it's not that important because so that's why I create a like a really dramatic shape. So it will create more interesting um, those levels, yeah. And um, I think that the uh, square, if if I understand right, you're asking the uh, area of the the tower, right? The first question, sorry. Yeah, the occupation of the the ground floor basically before I think the existing. I mean, at least according to the to the drawings that I was looking at, it seems like the footprint, the the way that the previous, the existing building was touching the ground was smaller, but maybe not, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yes, the footprint is actually, you're right, it's like really uh, basically occupied the entire place. And, but I also open up the really like kind of wide uh, pathway from this street to that one. So it's, it's like, originally we have a bunker hills on the very like side of the top, uh, site, the, uh, site so i'm moving that kind of program in the middle but more like adjusting to my tower that's why like yeah but also i found in the original us bank tower except that bunker hill step reservoir just not really used uh, like efficiently so right now the ground plans you can see on this plan can are mostly occupied except the the middle yeah Uh, 
I think as a conceptual seed or way into the project, this notion of middle ground is quite fascinating. I, I, would, I would really encourage you though to, um, I think represent it more forcefully um, in, in just about all drawings, um, especially the sections. Uh, I, I think it could be really interesting to imagine I mean, what you've done is, I think in, in many ways, you've displaced what is commonly a, a service core elevators, um, and you've replaced it with uh, public engagement, um, various programs. And I really wanna read that in the, in the drawings because I, I like it as an idea, as a, as a conception for a project. Okay. Um, so if there are no further comments, maybe we want to um, uh, close um, the uh, presentation. And if we have only a few minutes, then maybe we can um, use to um, maybe give final comments about the four projects you've seen. I know all of you have had the chance to work on the same project, and I'm sure you have a very different take on, on what it is that uh, the Biennale uh, proposed to us. And so maybe if you can just give us um, one sentence or two sentences about maybe what you are doing in your project and maybe something for the students to take home during this experience and this review. Well, I can tell you that our projects are completely different and they're all about the ground level. And we've been working on a, a literal crossroad uh, that's in Chicago that's very dangerous because of many uh, reasons, crimes, cars. Uh, so it's been a complete, it's really close to the ground and trying to find solutions to uh, create brave spaces rather than safe spaces in a neighborhood that needs it. So, but it's very interesting to see your work and, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody else is proposing. Yes. How about you, Eric? Uh, well, first, I just want to say thank you for the invitation today. It was really great to see the work of the students yeah. um, south of me. And um, I have a confession because my studio, in fact, uh, this semester that I taught at Cal is not the studio that I'm using for next summer's work. Um, and that's because uh, the topic was, it was a, it was kind of a forced topic and it didn't really fit the, the agenda for next summer. So I've, I'm borrowing work from uh, a couple of semesters ago and, and I'm looking, I've kind of gone back to a really fantastic studio that I taught with students. And it was, it was titled Migrations. We were looking at um, the, the conditions around human migration, both kind of forced in the world we live in today and ways in which the city can become a kind of a capture point, an absorption point for these changes that society, our, our society faces and um, build the, actually the topic that we're focusing on is refuge and um, within the kind of broad umbrella of options within uh, next summer's themes. So um, it was a really fantastic studio. The work was quite good uh, with a, a fourth year undergraduate class. Um, I, you know, it's a little bit of a strange scenario though. I really wish I would have been participating with a studio live time. I think it makes a lot of sense. And so I appreciate just seeing what you guys have done this semester, Lena. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. David, I know what you've done because I was in your review, but I think you should still tell uh, the students. Yeah, yeah, we are, well, we are actually doing, if you want two parallel things uh, that of course intertwine in many respects, which is, one, we are working on this idea of the museum of the everyday, which is a way to rethink the idea of museum. And in some ways from that, we also expand on this idea of refuge uh, as not just a refuge for emergency thing, but we, we consider actually our uh, entire condition where we leave the emergency. So museums could be places where actually uh, 
groups of people that intend to live their life in a different way than the one we are forced into can find a refuge, let's say, um, to, to say it very synthetically. Um, but yeah, it was great actually to see the work. And I think uh, if I can just say a couple of words that you, you have given the students really, really challenging brief, I think, because mm. you know to rethink the high rise is really a daunting task, I have to say. Um, but but I, I think actually the students came up with, with really powerful ideas and also some really stunning visual um, moments, let's say. Uh, and I think, uh, if anything, I would, I would uh, say that uh, some of these ideas could be brought forward actually with more radical attitude, let's say, and even in future projects they will do, uh, because I think there is a lot to, to dig into in a way. And I think that's to compliment also you, Elena, for, for, for this kind of uh, seeds that you are, that you are implanting in a way. So I think it's great. Uh, uh, Platon, you have the most beautiful name. So I, I don't know if I'm saying that, but reminds me of Platon in my high school time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, many thanks for inviting me. I think it was a really uh, amazing, uh, presentation. I mean, I, I also agree that um, the brief is extremely challenging and also very, very urgent to, to rethink the future of, of these typologies, high rise, but also the office. I think the office space is in general. I think it's a, it's a very um, interesting challenge for cities uh, around the world. So congratulations to everyone and to you, Ellen, and uh, Kumaran for the fascinating projects. Um, uh, in terms of what we're working for the Biennale, we're also not doing a particular studio this year. I mean, it's the agenda of uh, the MPhil is uh, already questions about collective living, uh, especially uh, for vulnerable communities and, and in locations around the world. So we are uh, exploring this anyway. So we have projects from this year, projects from previous years, and we're somehow organizing the material into a coherent, let's say, way. So uh, I'm really looking forward to see you all, uh, hopefully physically, <laughs> uh, and not virtually in, in <laughs> yes. Let's Let's see about that, but yes. yes. Juan Jose Lanos, I, I know what you've done, but yes, please tell our students. Yes, well, again, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and I'm always impressed with the intensity and the capacity to overcome any difficulty that, that the students have. I think this is a good example of the, the, the energy and the, the motivation that they find to really uh, produce a very interesting uh, and, 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 let's say, amazing work. Um, and, and I was kind of interested when Odile was mentioning that she's working in, at the ground level because uh, my studio is, is more interested about the roof, about the rooftops and, and this reinterpretation of the roof, rooftop in, infrastructures. And, and actually your studio, uh, Elena, is a bit connecting the ground with the, with the roof. So somehow it, this makes me feel uh, really interested also and curious about your work and, and I think the, the, the Biennale will be uh, hopefully a, a very nice opportunity to continue the conversation and to, to learn from each other also with our students. So thank you again and congratulations to the students. Well, thank you, Odile, Eric, uh, David, uh, Platon and Juan, and also Pietro and Stefano from UN Studio who are not doing uh, the uh, Biennale, but they're actually building many buildings <laughs> of this kind. So thank you for being here at our midterm and final. And by the way, you are all uh, welcome to stay with us. Uh, it is for and so now starting a new presentation for the new jury coming in. So you are still, you know, free to well, stay with us. But uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go, but thank you so much for having, having me. And I'm, I'm really thankful and I enjoyed all of the work that you, your students have done. Thank you so much for all of you guys. Thank you. Take, thank you. take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good luck. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Well, we're going to have a one-minute interval.
uh, with broadcasting from Kumaran while the new jury comes in. Um, just, you know, one minute while everybody logs in. Elena, you're muted. I love that. <laughs> uh, welcome to all the jurors of the second session of Rethinking Height. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here with us today and let you know that we are live streaming uh, to YouTube and we're recording. I am going to start with a short presentation about uh, the Vertical Studio and I will also present the esteemed jury. Uh, for um, this uh, two hours conversation we're gonna have. And hopefully then we're gonna have a nice conclusion with virtual drinks. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Yes. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? See? We do. Perfecto. So the studio is called uh, Rethinking Height. And um, this has been taught uh, for fall 2020. And for the people that are not from SciArc, uh, it is a vertical studio and it is uh, a mix of students from undergraduate, MR1 and MR2. I think actually exactly in the same proportion. So it was great to work with the students and to see the amount of uh, phenomenal talent that, that is in the entire school. And, um, Clearly, um, a big thank you to Kumaran, who has been the assistant teacher, right hand, left hand, and um, partner in crime, I think, of the all endeavor. It has been fantastic to work with him, and um, he introduced me to a new way of living, Gen Z. <laughs> so, the, um, so the impetus of the project comes from something I read in the news, actually, that um, a building that we all know in Los Angeles, for the people that are from here are in Los Angeles, the tower has been sold to Iberstein Properties for $430 million, which is actually a massive discount from what it was evaluated just one year ago. So it's been sold for something like 30% discount. And it's been sold to one of the big developers in New York, which is Iberstein Property, maybe you remember it for the World Trade Center development. And why I thought this was interesting? I thought it was interesting because it's a sign of our time that says that today, over 20% of downtown Los Angeles high-rise offices are actually sitting empty and clearly changing drastically the value of those buildings that as architects we are called to design. And so I thought maybe the topology of the office tower, it has to be rethought, the high-rise has to be rethought because in the age of coronavirus, tall building development are rapidly dropping in value. And also the class has been confronted with, I think, a very difficult task, which is reconciling uh, very powerful but opposite forces. Um, one is that um, we need high density buildings in a fast paced cities, growing cities. And Los Angeles is one of them, but also we have other countries that are building buildings even more than what the United States does. I mean, if the United States created probably the technology of the skyscraper, then that has been exported to many other countries. And then 
we do need these buildings, but on the other hand, then we also know as architects that they do something to our environment. They impoverish the public realm at the base, at the plinth, uh, at the plinth when the you know at the plinth when they touch the ground, and also now we have this new risk of virus transmission that makes it very hard for people to say I am going to go to work in a place where I have to enter an elevator. I mean, this is actually the reality we, we live in. And not to mention what happens to public transportation when you actually are serving high density uh, city and when you actually have to move towards this place of work. And so contrary to the never ending global race to build the tallest skyscraper in the world, which is this, what this small diagram here does, uh, explains how taller and taller and taller humankind is trying to build, have been trying to build in the centuries, the studio argues that the high rise topology needs to drop. Um, and so the studio approach to towers will go beyond the trait of being solely rhetorical, a seemingly unescapable quality of building to be an advertisement for themselves. You know, we, we know as architects, we are called to do this. We are called to make iconic building where the top of the building is one of the most important iconic ar architectural trade. And on the other hand, the studio is making a case for occupying, instead of occupying a skyline with a top, uh, actually investing some of our creativity and talent in understanding a new mobility in creating vibrant civic spaces and planning for a safer private public live work um, kind of office buildings uh, and really consider the facade rather than the top of the building one of the most important element of design along with the plinth of the building itself. And so the position of the studio is really grounded in the belief that yes, we like to think about architecture in an autonomous way as a discipline, but at last contingent to the physical con contingency to the physical context is quite important. And ultimately, tall buildings have a responsibility much more towards how they meet the ground, this, this is what it looks like when they meet the ground, rather than how to meet the sky, which is this. So instead of understanding that the top of the building will actually go beyond the sky level and go above the, the uh, um, about the clouds, actually we're going to think about how it meets the ground itself, because that is the place where human contact and public space uh, actually are important for the city of the city for the level of the city interaction. Also, uh, a note that uh, the studio is part of the 2021 Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism. Um, so we are asked, along with other 42 schools all around the globe to make our contribution to the Biennale uh, coming up uh, next year. Um, the curator is Dominique Perrault. Um, the theme of the Biennale is Crossroad, Building the Resilient City. And there are three curators, uh, one, the one that actually takes care of the academic uh, uh, branch of the Biennale is Marc Rossa, that has been organizing and collecting the work of 43 schools. So we're talking about probably 500 students. Uh, the Biennale will be open from September 11th to November 11th in 2021. Hopefully we'll be there in person. Uh, Dominique Barron, uh, as a theme for the Biennale, identified five crossroads, which will be explained by the students because they selected certain qualities of these quite five crossroads in order to think about them. Uh, but mainly as a studio, we thought about the relationship between above and below, um, natural and artificial, and safety and risk. These are the three things that we thought were the most important part of what the topology of a building uh, as a skyscraper is, and how then can we create the resilient skyscraper for the future. And clearly, we gave them uh, as a topic, uh, as a site, as a program, the design of the US Bank Tower. So how do you rethink this kind of building that has changed uh, its value so drastically in one year? And how does this become a resilient building for the future? And for the people that don't know this, this has been designed by Andrew Cobb in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, it's a 73-story building and was for a long, long time one of the tallest building at the west of Mississippi. And I think it was built in uh, 1989, 1990 was finished. 
Uh, these are some of the drawings of the original building. And the work of the students will be collected uh, in a catalog and will be exhibited in the Biennale. So there will be a show uh, where the printouts uh, of the work uh, will be in exhibition for uh, the length of, of, the, of the studio. Also, there is a small component of a um, uh, competition, which we will not explain today for the sake of the sake of time, we don't have the time to do that one too. Uh, but the students also design a refuge in a full scale prototype. Uh, 10 of the 40 would be chosen to build it and will be given funds to build it. Um, the Biennale will be uh, in the Zahadi building in Seoul, uh, the Dong Gan Design Museum Plaza. The jury. Uh, thank you for all being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, most of you know what the topic of the studio is because you are actually doing this with your own student in your own um, school. And it was a pleasure for me to be able to have you here today. And I try to invite most of the people that are part of this 43 schools around the world. And accordingly to the different time zones, uh, the people that are here, are the people that could actually be awake at this time. So thank you for your participation. Some of you are in, in difficult time zones. So I'm gonna go and read um, uh, the session two. So Jasmine Benjamin, uh, Associate Professor, School of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Angela Brooks, Managing Principal of Brooks and Scarpa and co-founder of Livable Places. Andrea Cadioli, Visual Study Faculty at SIARC. Peter Ferretto, again, he is a faculty that is also giving this project to the student, Associate Professor and MARC Program Chair in the School of Architecture at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, founder and principal of P.W. Ferretto. Margaret Griffin, Design Studio Faculty in SIARC and co-founder and principal of Griffin and Wright Architects. Jeanette Kim, Associate Professor of Architecture and co-director Urban Works Agency, uh, both at California College of Art and also founding principal, all of the above. And finally, Sylvia Michele, Senior Lecturer at the School of Architecture at the University of Queensland. So I'm gonna now stop sharing. Uh, welcome to Seoul. And I will now give the, um, um, the microphone to our students. Um, so please, uh, the first project is Nick. Hi everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, so I, I was tasked with introducing just uh, briefly out of the site um, for the, all of the preceding projects. And so the US Bank Tower is located right off the highway um, that cuts through downtown. Um, right across the street is the, the LA library, downtown library branch um, from which the tower got its name, originally the, the library tower. Um, and it's, it's well within the, the surrounding towers of um, downtown Los Angeles. And maybe more specific to my project is um, noticing that there's quite a few um, towers that I would, I guess, call a twin or a double um, that surround the site. And then here in the middle is this idiosyncratic tower of the, um, the US Bank Tower. And so, Coming into my project. Um, so once vibrant downtown business districts have been decimated over the past nine months as the world reels from coronavirus, the necessity of working from home has led to the rethinking of the tall office tower um, as they begin to be sold at a fraction of the cost as seen with the US Bank Tower. The tall tower, an unsustainable and sensitive typology that facilitates polluted cities and the spread of disease through close proximities uh, needs examination. In the uncertainty of the current situation, this project's doubling of the towers is seen as an alternative to the recent trends in upward growth. The once tall monolith of the US Bank Tower is divided into several low masses uh, that retain the square footage of the overall tower. Um, the tower organizes itself through a series of developable, developable blocks holding various programs um, and organize themselves into arrangements that open up towards the library that is across the street. Through this, four solutions to the problem of height result. 
One, access is relegated entirely to the exterior of the building um, as it tackles the problem of safety and risk. If we dive into that, uh, one must never formally enter the tower in order to reach one's residence slash office space. Cores are placed alongside each other the length of the tower um, and result in the splaying of entrances. Since these cores are placed beneath the actual interior of the tower, it results in the abolishment of the formal lobby, an outdated symbol of class, capital class in bygone society, unnecessary in today's day and age. Um, the splaying of cores allows for this bridged access uh, to three long yet skinny state tower massings. And the breakdown of the programming from the US bank and into the new tower um, with its individual blocks provides uh, pr primarily new mixed use housing projects uh, with the retention of some, some of the housing as seen as in the US bank. Um, from the exterior cores, one can access as one goes up. So these are typical floor plans um, throughout the tower. Um, and so from the exterior core, one can access the programming of which a majority is housing, but some office and retail. Um, and on the west grouping, which is tower one, two masses are connected or bridged through to form the shape or the silhouette of one. Um, so from these modest massings, a series of double facades emerge to encompass and mask the towers, um, which are then clad. So tower one is clad in dark reflective materials um, which hides the mixed use programming beneath a murky double facade that at once reflects the city around it and refutes it, creating an image of several towers that form into one. Tower two is a residential tower, a much needed typology in housing strapped Los Angeles. Its facade is in a polar opposite of tower one per se, um, yet it displays a deep layering of colored beams and railings and columns in front of movable panels. The daily moving of these panels to suit the needs and, uh, of the resident causes the building's image to tremor and shimmer as residential autonomy is put on display. The bright colors provide a reflection of lifestyle in sunny Southern California that clashes grandly with the existing downtown Los Angeles building tones. Uh, and third, in order to attract people and retain people in cities, there are interstitial public spaces for an excessive outdoor private spaces for each residence. In lieu of the desire for more space at home, every residence is granted a balcony, a gray space sandwiched between two facades, which maybe can be better seen right here. Um, in a similar, similar manner, every five floors, a public floor is lifted to about 1.5 times the size of their relative block. These public spaces allow for alternative programming sky gardens, urban farming, zen floors, parks and playgrounds, private and public space for a downtown that lacks accessible public space. Um, and finally, the fourth thing with its relationship to the city or the plinth, um, the Grand Plaza is entirely free from buildings. Tower one has been lifted off on pilotes, leaving only the corner, the, the cores as means of access to above. Tower two remains at ground level, yet the plaza sweeps beneath it, creating a brooding chasm one enters down into before ascending to the cheery tower above. Uh, and I guess that could be best be seen here as you see that the, the plaza, I guess, folds in on itself. Um, and the tower's placement allows for a chamfering of the corners of the block as pedestrians cut the corner. It also provides an ex as an extension of the library park across the street. The plinth and plaza begin at ground level on the west side of the site and gradually spiral down through ramps and stairs um, around on itself uh, between and beneath the other tower, creating a multi-level plinth with access to parking and the city's transportation network below. And so in the endless spirit of this project, scattered stones and trees growing from lower floors, exchange order for spontaneous interaction with strange objects and nature. Um, and this, this is where we get in more into the, the refuge, which we designed to possibly be built in, 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 the, uh, in the Biennale. And so this one is, it represents different moments 
found in nature, some real, some imagined um, context list. They remind us of our unknown position in a world full of mysteries. And back to the tower in ending, in the wake of other twin towers in Los Angeles, uh, from which there are many, this project attempts to rethink height through access, emphasis on the plan, proximity to public or outdoor space, um, and the consolidation of program into small indiv individualized blocks. And I will just put, can everyone see this animation? Um, I'll put this animation on right now, but um, if you have requests to go back to a certain slide, I can do that as well. So I just have a question about the program, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. uh, are, the, ha, are the two towers programmed similarly or what's the difference, if any? Um, yes. So let me go back to... Are they both, is one housing and one is office is, is the... So yeah, I guess I should have explained that more. So. Uh, this color right here is office. So one is one is half ha office and it's bridged. There's there's quite a big se separation. It's not like it's right across the hall. Um, so it's it's separated from this block, which is housing. This tower, on the other hand, is purely housing. Um, and if you go to the plan, you can kind of see that this is more of an open layout, whereas this is definitely residential on the back side of this tower and um, the entirety of this tower. So that's why you were talking about live work. It's not, it's not live work per se. It's like live work because I could live across the hallway from my work. You could, but they're, they're also, um, if, I, if I did mention live work, it was, it was a mistake because it's not intended to be live work. Um, they're, they're just uh, adjacent to each other, but there, there can be, or there, there must not be a connection between the two. And then one more question, the plaza that you made, the steps that you show in the ground plan, is that going up or going down? Is that a sunken plaza or a raised plaza? It's, go it's going down. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, th this you can, this side is all ground level, street level, curb level. And from there, from this cut, it starts descending. And so this, which is the, the, ground, the ground floor of tower two is actually raised above the actual plaza, if that makes sense. Hi, Nick, could I ask a question? Yes. Could you just explain a little bit about how the orientation of these two uh, towers and also the, the facade. It seems that one facade is articulated and the others are more flat. Could you explain, and also the materiality, one's gold and one's black. Could you just explain the history behind that? Yeah, so I, I guess the, um, the orientation, uh, it, was, it started at the very beginning with wanting to open up towards the, um, the library and to provide like kind of a, a dialogue or a, a plaza between the, the library and these these to other towers that line the opposite side of the street, which now all um, give or take come up to the come up to the setback, um, and so th that's where the I guess orientation came with these this this flipping and rotating. Um, as for the facades, since this is just a residential tower, and since there was I guess more of a need. This, this is the office side right here. And there, there was less of a need to create um, space and openings for each, each or, um, for the office, I guess. And it, whereas the residential, I wanted everyone to have access to balconies, um, to windows, to, I guess, personal space. And so that's, that's where the, you get this kind of layering, whereas this one's much more flat um, and 
colors. Um, I wouldn't say there's like a, I guess I was, I was looking at, at twins um, and twin towers. And I, I noticed that they're all relatively the same, especially surrounding the site. There's, there's one right here in the back that's just red brick and the two towers are both red brick. Uh, there's one to the side over here um, and it's just black glass. And I, I just noticed that every, every double, doubling of tower ends up being pretty much the same facade treatment. And so to create more of a, I guess to start a con conversation about these tw twin towers, um, the, the colors became, I guess, very, very opposite. Vic, thank you for your presentation. I found it very clear. I'm uh, particularly interested in the um, section um, and uh, um, in the way you have uh, divided uh, the building in blocks. Mm -hmm. So are you, by doing, by making this choice, you've been thinking about creating communities within uh, the high rise and uh, um, how that uh, um, choice is uh, uh, influencing the social behavior. Um, so I, I guess it all is stemmed from noticing that how people fled the city uh, during COVID. And so a large, a large part of the project was about creating these spaces that, that could be communal, that could be that you're not just stuck in your apartment, um, that just a couple of floors below you, there's there's a, a space that can be used in a variety of ways. Um, and sorry, what was, it, what was the question again? Was it how, how it creates a community or how? It, yeah, how the division in blocks uh, um, affects uh, um, the, the, the population of the building. So I was thinking if uh, you were creating this connection between these blocks uh, and the sub-communities in the building. So I, I guess since neither building has a lobby, and that was, that was a very um, intentional move to... to allow access to these buildings without actually engaging anyone if you don't want to. These, these, uh, these floors kind of serve as the, 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 the result. And they're, they're, they are, they, they allow for this communal engagement that you might miss if you're, not entering a building through a lobby or if you aren't. And, and another thing for, for this tower, which is residential on this side and office on this side, it creates a space where you're not only meeting with people or encountering people from your own neighborhood, um, you're also encountering people from, from the city, you could say. And so it's, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interrupting someone. No, you can go. I'll go. After. Um, since you're in this section, um, I would like to maybe suggest um, an opportunity that I think you lost, but which is pretty phenomenal in your case. Well, the fact is that when you're building offices topologies and when you're building residential topologies, the height of the ceiling is generally different because there are different needs. And this would allow your section to become extremely more interesting in terms of speed levels, because you would have two different movements across in elevation. And this could be an incredible moment where the function would not land on the same floor, like the same height would become an issue in terms of circulation, but actually would start having um, offset one to the other. And this would also make your uh, circulation more appealing in terms of experience and also your balconies, these big uh, garden, um, uh, sky garden, could really become an opportunity to become part of the circulation. At the moment, I notice this very strong differentiation in terms of function in between 
gardens that they don't necessarily have a difference in between the different heights where they are positioned. And by the way, I, I would drop something on the roof. Seems like the place where it is most um, easy to have gardens has been uh, disregarded. But again, I would say that if you start working with split levels and you start treating the circulation not simply as a clash with the garden, but an, an integral part in this organization, this would become a, an incredible solution for you in terms of architectural experience. And also, I think this would go back to your pavilion where the synthetic and the organic nature uh, are so well integrated. At the moment you're building, you have this amazing um, uh, ecosystem in the facade and you are creating different ecosystems inside the building, but the two, they look like they are separate and they're shielding each other. They are not cooperating or integrating. Um, I really think that if you are looking at these uh, typologies, not as uniform and also the circulation and the function not in a uniform and separate way, but more integrated way, your pavilion that looks stunning will start um, influencing again your towers that by the way are also incredibly well designed. So this is both um, a missed opportunity and a compliment. You can take whatever you want from this comment. No, I, that's, that's great, great advice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that in, in terms of the, the missed opportunity of the differential heights for um, office versus housing. But I, I see your project not so much as twin towers as, as, as a little bit more twin slabs. I, I think your towers are much more slab-like than they are tower-like. And um, I think as such, I would think about how they're placed on the site a little more like like to me the strongest move you make is the way that you're trying to make a uh, define that urban space uh, facing to the library. Um, but if I really think about how you located it in the plan, there is space on the other side that that you could have uh, you could have pushed the tower or the slabs what I would call slabs back farther and give more more void more definition to that void facing the library. And then, yeah, I, I think if they really are a kind of two slabs that are cracked in half, I, I think like it's, for me, it's too simple to say like, oh, all the other twin towers are like designed so that they're exact same. So my solution is gonna be that they're gonna be different. I, I think like it, it, it could have been more of a diptych, more of like a relationship between that difference um, somehow more intentionally, um, it, so it would be okay to have these two slabs be different, but if they were somehow different in a way that was like more complementary, uh, explicitly, m more clearly complementary, um, I, I think that would be stronger. And, and I do think that the missed opportunity is that is the way to integrate the, um, the office building part, and maybe it doesn't have to be so continuous maybe the office level uh, part is, is more discontinuous. And so then you have the kind of cracked slab of the housing and then the integration of the office like as a layer on top of it. And maybe also that it doesn't have to be so much like one tower has office and, and housing and the other tower only has housing. Like I, I think I would have thought of that office as being able to bridge the two a little more. Um, so that they both might have housing and office, but they do it in a slightly different way. And that could be one way that you could build that complementary relationship of let's say a diptych. Um, I, I, I also think that I, I know that um, Elena framed it by saying that the top of the tower um, doesn't have to be differentiated. But one thing that's interesting is in LA for years, uh, you had to make the top flat because you had to have a helicopter land and that is now changed. So now finally in LA, you can have a tower that has a unique top because you don't have to have a helicopter pad on it, which is a recent change. Um, so I, I do think like that the top of the tower is, is, is something that could be differentiated. And then I really also question if you should descend 
into the plaza. Like I, 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 I think a sunken plaza, we have so many examples of sunken plazas in LA that are just horrifying. They, they don't work. They're, they're uninhabitable. People, businesses don't thrive there. People don't want to be there. Like, like I really question the sunken plaza. Um, and I don't think you needed it for what you wanted to do. Like, like I think that just takes um, activity away from the, from the street and from the sidewalk. Um, so I think you could have um, uh, like act, activated those plazas with some relief, but I, I'm not sure I would sink it what seems like almost a full story. I think just up the street is the California Plaza, which is like very dead space, very, very sad space, that California Plaza. Um, I don't know if you've ever been there, but like it, it, it's desolate, not even when there's COVID just on normal time. So, so I question the sunken plaza. Is that, is that right next to Mocha? Uh, it's up uh, between, yeah, the California Plaza is the one that cantilevers over. It's, it's, yeah, okay. it's near Mocha and right. It has mm -hmm. that whole fake like landscapey thing and those fountain. They tried to activate <laughs> all this like uh, kind of fake landscape situation, but it, 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 it really is problematic. Yeah, I think, and I think, thanks, Nick, for that presentation. I think why it was dead is because it was completely separate from the sidewalk. Um, and um, rather than a sunken, sunken plaza, what I really liked about your comment that you were eliminating the lobby and creating this sort of ground floor geographic space that really acts like a lobby, um, I thought that was really great. And your images of landscapes and sort of forgotten landscapes, you know, I can kind of see the whole ground floor of your project being the living room for your, for your project, because you've really densified the square footage of what was there, it looks like, and you're um, combining both housing and office space. And so you really, I think, wanna have this sort of living room that connects this building to the rest of the city kind of at that street level, which I thought was great. But I wanted to just say a few things about kind of coronavirus and just the pandemic because um, I was just on a panel with a few other people talking about how architecture is going to change because of the pandemic. And I just wanted to kind of step back from that because one thing that people haven't been talking about with as much urgent urgency is climate change. And I think climate change is really going to affect how we design in a much more um, significant way than this pandemic, which hopefully will be over with by the end of next year once we get a vaccine. Um, and I do think it's going to change the way architects design buildings. And in the past, pandemics have forced the evolution of city planning. Things like our sewer system, um, indoor plumbing, you know, all these things have really come about because of pandemics. And I think we have to kind of create a new kind of architecture that, that, that talks to this idea of climate change that's coming. So I, I really appreciated the way that you um, articulated your facades and would love to hear more about how they either generate energy or sort of become these vertical gardens. Um, I really, if you look to Singapore has um, what they call, I think they're called super trees. They're 80 to 160 feet tall and they're literally just trees that are vertical gardens over 100 acres with uh, solar panels on them. And I would love to see your, your architecture sort of become more this hybrid between this land, this idea of landscape and open space um, and architecture. Um, and then also when I looked at some of your housing units, they looked a little traditional. And I think um, what the pandemic has also told us is we're starting, we're gonna be living in a different way. Um, and it's not gonna be, we're gonna have more shared spaces, I really believe. So um, there are countries where there are buildings that are actually high rises and they're called kitchenless homes because the kitchen is on the ground floor and the kitchen becomes kind of this social space for where people live above. So I would also encourage you to think more, more about how people live in sort of housing types and maybe you can expand on this idea of how people live so that your, the uses of your building also expand vertically the same way that you're sort of expanding the public space up vertically from the city. Maybe if I could build on that, um, 
Nick, I think your project is so inventive in the way that you're rethinking this typology of the tower. I, I love this kind of like these moments where it twists. And um, I think that point that Angelo is making about a super porous building is really important if you look back at the history of like air conditioning and the tower and that idea of a kind of very insulated structure. And I think I love that your refuge can kind of really blow that open. Um, and I also really enjoy the fact that you are kind of re reworking this idea of a lobby and kind of re um, decentralizing the circulation. Um, and I also really love that you're kind of splitting these two sides between live and work. So I think that's just fascinating. Like they're all truly inventive moves. Um, and then I was just wondering about maybe more about like the attitude of your stance as a designer, right? Like, I think in some ways you presented your project a little bit like problem solving. You're like, I did it, you know, I, uh, now people can circulate without having to interfere with each other. You know, and now, now I can accommodate this changing real estate market and so on. And I was just wondering, I, I wanted to put forward the, the idea that maybe in addition to being a problem solver, you could also put yourself forward as a kind of strategist um, who could be maybe a bit more responsive to multiple kinds of change. And I think this is where maybe my comment gets back to the issues of climate change that Angela is bringing up. That, you know, we could think about moments like extreme vacancy or a boom economy or, you know, a very, very different model of the, the split between living and working and so on. So if you imagine all those changes and imagine that we don't know how or when those changes will happen, right? I, I wonder if like, for example, the way you have the split floor plane um, between live and work might have more transience or like ability to um, slip or alternate between the one program type or the other. Or similarly, I wonder if this idea of having like your insanely great refuge in this porous tower might also reference like strange vacancy or like under occupation and start to turn a down economy into something actually quite lovely. Hi, Nick. Um, I, I wonder if the, met the working metaphor, it, it sort of trips you up and it sets up a series of expectations from the outset, right? This, not just that they're doubles, but they're mute, right? So. And then you go on to say that the, the facade reflects and refutes the city, right? So there's this sort of this idea of the talking building or sort of architecture parlante or non parlante or whatever. But I think the working uh, metaphor maybe would be more that this is a ham sandwich, right? Like if you were to think of this as a ham sandwich that then got split apart, the, the pieces of Wonder Bread being the housing Right, and then the stuff inside being the circulation, and the offices being the lettuce and the ham, and you know, and what that does, I think, is that it also creates a kind of clarity about the initial move you make on the site, right? So if you go back to the site plan, the way that it's hinged uh, or not hinged, <laughs> but but the, the, they're sort of tantalizingly close. I'm not sure. I'm convinced of the argument that there's a that there's a kind of a uh, a flipping, but in any case, I think that condition also addresses some of what Margaret was saying about the, the in-between, um, that there is a kind of clarity about, oh yes, this used to be a ham sandwich, and now I've taken apart the bread because I don't like lettuce, right? So I've taken the lettuce out. And in order to do that, I've had to sort of, you know, pry it open, right? And But in that prying open, there is a kind of urban messaging, which is that something happened between those two at some point, right? That they used to be together and they're no longer together. And so that might happen at the plaza level um, or it might happen further up, right? So in other words, there might be some uh, leftover lettuce or mayonnaise or something that, that connects, that still attaches the two or two and a half or three, right? And I think that that maybe also just get, gets you out of the twinness um, because I think there are also just so many connotations with that. The other thing I would say is like the, 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 the elevation is fascinating to me. The fact that it's not quite as tall as the other one. So the housing one is just sort of like, it, it's almost like, is it a mistake? Did he do that on purpose? You know what? It's sort of like the, you know, the blue and yellow one, sort of there was a sinkhole or something and it just kind of sunk a little bit, you know? Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I think there's a kind of urban messaging that can happen the way that the building talks to the city 
that can be clarified. And that can begin at the initial party of how these things came to be, right? But it's a beautifully drawn project. The other comment I would have is that at the angles, that detail of the uh, this sort of uh, uh, lattice, let's say, on that's sort of angled, you have that one section drawing where it sort of comes in um, at the wall. Yes, so uh, yes, where it comes in and then it sort of splays out. I mean, I think those are opportunities for also having a kind of having that skin be more performative, right? So it's, it seems a little, I would wanna know more about that detail, <laughs> right? Where the angle comes down and then there's this little picking up again. What is that gray stuff in between, right? And I think those are moments where, you know, do you express it as an autonomous skin? If so, then that wouldn't happen. Um, you know, and if it's not autonomous, is there something, a break in the section there, right? Do you use those opportunities, the module that you set up with that bending as a way to inform the programming on the interior? Maybe those are places where a lifting occurs because it's more of a public shared common sort of portion of the section. So those are my thoughts, but I, I it's a beautifully drawn project and I actually, um, you know, I, it might be depressing, but I, I like the idea of a sunken thing, like going down into it. But that's also maybe because I lived in New York for 10 years and maybe they work better there than they do in L.A. But um, I would like to think that this has some um, possibilities. Good work. Thank you. Hi, hi Nick. Uh, this is uh, Peter. I'm calling from Hong Kong. So I think uh, it's um, I think you. Um, I'm reading your project in a specific way. And I think your intuition and your reaction is um, uh, very on, on the ball because I think your project is a reaction to what is there because there's a big difference and you see it very much in Hong Kong between an office block and a housing tower. There's a really big difference of how the office uh, tower is very sealed and the housing tower is very open. And I think that's one of the things that I like about your project, because in a way, intuitively, you're going on to what I call the interstitial spaces. And in Hong Kong, actually, this break that you put between every sort of five in Hong Kong, it's every 10 stories is a necessity for fire. So the fact that you, you're kind of working on the interstitial, the fact that you could actually implement these things in terms of code, to me, makes it very interesting. Uh, and I think maybe the, the, the premise of how you set it up as an argument could be, could be changed. I think you, you set it up pragmatically, but I, I think you could also set it up theoretically in the fact that the tower is about interstitial byproduct moments. And you could actually use that into, in your argument, you could make that a, a case. Uh, but the question I have is that you showed for like a split second, a refuge. And I think there's a, there's a link between your refuge and your tower because your refuge in a way is corrupting something, is, is kind of a moment, kind of a, a utopic moment, a split second that breaks a kind of the, the city's kind of um, everyday life. And I wonder if this kind of corruption could, is, is part of your tower project. And this is a question for you. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I... I imagine it is. Um, I think that was maybe the the entire the entirety of the project was taking very modest towers, very perhaps traditional towers, and um, not not performing some great formal. I guess shift in tower typology, but but corrupting it in other ways. And for me, that was with the the facade and with these interstitial levels. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Nick, for your presentation uh, and for introducing the jury to uh, our project and also the refuge uh, that. Um, 
you know, you will see that the refuge, it was another part of the, of the competition and the students will have it sprinkled in their project. Um, thank you so much for the craft and the quality of the work and the beautiful presentation. And now I'm gonna give the microphone to uh, Jesse and Julia. Hello everyone. Hi. Can everybody hear us? Yes. Yep. See, the, see the screen, hopefully, yes. Yep, we do. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, and actually before I do that, let me give you guys the link in the chat. So we just linked our website in the chat if anybody wants to go look, all the materials are on there and all the animations are on there, but we'll, we'll be covering everything here as well. Okay. So hi, I'm Julia McConnell. Hi, I'm Jesse Helgeson. Um, and we worked on a project called A Côté Deux, or Side by Side. Uh, and in A Côté Deux, traditional tower typology sets up the relationship between above and below is the antithesis standardization of urban relationships where plinth is dominating and closed off from the city's inhabitants. Towers where developers hold all power and mass is dominated by the need to fill and expand rapidly for maximum profit fill the city. Akate Deux seeks to challenge this dynamic by placing mass and void side by side in the sky, expanding the open ground as plinths, and reducing towering skyline heights that no longer reflect the global the needs of a global population. And so the precedent um, to our tower was the US Bank Tower. Um, and just taking a look at it, you can see that it has a very narrow footprint um, and it's primarily comprised of densely packed office spaces. Um, and it's very contained and um, kind of clustered. And if you go into our building diagrams, you can see that we've kind of halved the height of the US Bank Tower and increased it um, horizontally, which um, kind of gets rid of that abandon of the tall tower typology, which has fallen to class A during the recent pandemic. And so our proposal doubles the footprint and then proposes also a mixed use program as well. Yeah, and on the bottom, you'll see a sort of varied series of iterative massing strategy diagrams where ground is sort of supplanted and placed four stories in the sky. Uh, it was important for us to engage with Plinth in a way that didn't eliminate the ground as a viable source. So in this project, ground condition is actually raised four stories up and core is the singular point of contact with the ground. With that being said, the Plinth becomes the sky lobby condition wherein the precedents and typolog typological questions set out by the brief about artificial and natural are sort of synthesized. So you have both hardscape, artificial, natural park, and you have uh, the sort of interlocking moments with the refuge condition, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that populate the plants uh, to not only create that as a sky lobby condition, but also to act as a space for refuge, quiet reflection away from the sort of dense, the density of the city ground. And then going into our office plan, um, you're able to see this open atrium space that actually ext extends throughout the entire tower cool. vertically. And then it's linked together by two bridges that also link together the two opposing masses. Um, and then also in terms of just the organization of the office plan itself, we kind of took on the density of a more traditional office, but then made it more individual. So it's more singular, smaller offices, and then cubicles that are partitioned off to kind of take the lessons we've learned um, during COVID. And then going into the residential plan, again, it's um, a little bit more traditional in the particular units, but um, the corridors are much larger. And um, it also shows the shift of the facade, the kind of this external expression that you get as you go from the more rigid boxier side that contains the residential and office into the more kind of flexible and open um, garden space that also has the parking garage. And then looking at the section, um, this is really just to show this void in the center between the void between the um, rectilinear shape and then the cylinder shape and kind of how it links together the two very different masses between the two and then also unifies all the different programs um, just going off of this center void space. Yeah, 
And so looking at that slightly tilted primitive of the box mass that Jesse was talking about, that engages what was brought up in the previous review, um, engaging the LA skyline in a new way uh, with helipad code changing. You can actually have a roof that engages differently, but on the side with the elevation, you also see a difference between that sort of architecture parlant facade that reflects the city back uh, with a mirrored effect versus the sort of plein air portion, the open screen system that acts to protect the green space from the sort of wind condition that you're dealing with in a tower naturally and also gets built up upon layers uh, and both remain linked by that sort of interstitial void space in the center uh, that runs all the way through. And then these are just two diagrams that looked into the crossroads that Elena mentioned earlier um, that our proposal was really going into. And then one was the above and below relationship where we, instead of um, kind of configuring the ground within the city, we raised the actual um, ground that the building occupies and that becomes more of a lobby and the hardscape that you saw in the point plan. And then in addition to it being uh, above and below relationship. We also have that side by side that's joined by that atrium space and the core that links together the two towers. And then on the right is the natural and artificial where um, the cylinder that holds the automated parking garage also on the outside is just a series of vertical sky gardens that links together these two very different um, typologies of um, different types of areas. And then also on the very top, you still have access to where it also has these sky gardens, but in addition to um, these portable gardens that are part of the refuge project. Yeah, and so just a quick zoom in on the on the skin condition on the sort of open air one, the skin is, remains an active part of the architecture, both allowing greenery to be grown on it, but also doing the sort of protective element job that we talked about a little bit earlier. You also see through the cores themselves are buried, uh, but linked. So the idea was to have that central core run as mass but have moments of, of opacity and transparency within the entirety of the read of the facade itself. And then these are just more getting into um, the differences between the two facades as they are situated next to each other. Um, for the one that's on the residential and office side, it's kind of more kind of a take on just the curtain wall system that the other buildings in the site it's surrounded by where it reflects, um, it's kind of having the reflection of those buildings cast on itself um, and has a slight transparency. And then when lights come on, you could really see inside of these units. And then um, on the other side, it's creating just this series of layers that combine to create this really perforated um, and airy facade that creates a moray effect that allows the plants to grow um, within it. Yeah, and so I'm gonna rush through the refuge a little bit, but if you have any questions, um, we can go back. That's also all on the website. Jesse's refuge looked at the idea of a seed vault uh, working off of the famous one in Svalbard but also the idea that every person within a city context would have access to a garden. So her, her project takes the idea of above and below and works with the above, working with that top garden space that is a triple story space and introduces, yeah, you can see it in the section there, introduces a sort of interactive garden space that works with hydroponics uh, to allow a sort of interactive garden for the city's inhabitants. Uh, and my refuge, Hideout uh, occupies the plinth, as we saw in the previous drawings, uh, but we'll look at again in that exploded axon. Populates the plinth with a series of anechoic chambers that can be used as we're all working from home now with probably a roommate or two. We all need to escape at points and ha inhabitants of this tower, whether office or residential, can go into these spaces and inhabit the plinth in isolation in a different kind of way, in silence, in a city context that is dense and loud uh, and at points taxing, even when refuge, traditionally the home space has been compromised given the conditions of COVID. Yeah, and so I will go ahead and I'm just gonna play a quick animation of the facade. Feel free to talk. This is also all on the website.
I have a quick question for you guys. So the cylindrical side, um, the program on that side, is there, um, is that all just only circulation or is there a program on that cylindrical side? So that is, oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. In the middle is just an automated parking garage, but then the floor plates that actually surround it and then extend out to the facade is just kind of like a pathway that is predominant, like predominated by a sky park. But then at the, so it's kind of more of a circulation space, but it's wide enough to allow people to kind of hang out there and relax. But the very top, um, and then the one that just is situated be right below the slit, um, in the cylinder, both are wide and open, just um, sky parks that have um, gardens and then kind of more places for people to sit. The, the distance from the car park to the edge of the plate is about 15 feet. So you've got, you've got room, it's sort of a meander idea. Um, so, uh, well, I think to me, one of the most exciting things about your project is the lifted plinth, uh, floating the plinth in the air sectionally and having a, a space below it, that's the public space I could imagine. And I can see in this rendering how you're uh, cutting holes through the plant and you're bringing light all the way down to that ground level. So I think that's super smart. And in a, in a way you kind of uh, almost triple the ground plane by doing that because you have the street level, you have like inside that plant, which could be public and then you have the top of that plant. So I think like, um, I find that idea super interesting. I really think the cylinder part, uh, uh, well, I think the interaction of the two towers is also really um, intriguing. Uh, the fact that there's this kind of one piece at the top that like clips on, uh, but I do think it's a missed opportunity around that cylinder. I, I think you could easily have micro housing around there. Um, uh, like micro housing is anywhere from 175 square feet to 375 square feet, which is uh, smaller than a one car garage and smaller than a two car garage. So it, it doesn't even have to be uh, continuous micro housing, but it could be discontinuous. So you could still get like some garden areas, but I, I feel like that 15 foot swath uh, could easily be more inhabited by, by, by housing actually. And I, I think it would only make your project better. Uh, like I think that emptiness of that side uh, needn't be so empty. And especially since you um, have this whole idea of the kind of vertical garden uh, on the facade of it, I, I think that would go perfectly with, with allowing like actual housing to occur there as well. Um, like uh, 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 all around that. And um, you could, you could, actually get a huge amount of housing that would be right next to parking and would be a different kind of housing that was in the other tower. And the other tower, because it's pretty deep, is much more well suited. It, it, it's, it's more suited for uh, office space than housing anyway, because of its floor plate depth. So um, I think that like thin layer around your cylinder um, is, a, is a missed opportunity for some, some some kind of uh, needed housing in the city. But, but I, I think your project's beautiful and, and I think a lot of the components are really well considered. Uh, hi there, maybe I, uh, I have a question and, and also a, a comment. I, uh, I'm really fascinated and I think I've, I've um, it reminds me of so many projects, your, your, your cylindrical uh, tower. It sort of recalls something that I used to study, a project that I studied in when I was a student, the Toyoito's um, Tower uh, of Wind in Tokyo. And what is interesting to me is that you're kind of redefining what public space is. And, and in terms of the car park could be a public space that you go through. I think this, you should make more of this. And I think the presidents, uh, especially, I recall like Herzl Demeron's uh, project in Miami, where you've actually gone one step further. This is a public space that people, you know, the city can come in. And, and I think that, the, and the facade is interesting because it kind of sucks people up. But I, I think that moment where I find it difficult is where the cylinder or the in-between space between the cylinder and, and the kind of rectangular block. And I think 
maybe the answer is you could sort of talk a little bit about how you position the core because the core seems conventional when it, when actually it could be at the heart of that public space so that's that's my question to you yeah i mean i think i think the core pre midterm there were two very separate cores um, and i think the feedback and the sort of direction ended up being to really link them via that void space i think the core ended up being a sort of, you're, we weren't allowed to actually say that cars could, people could stay in the cars all the way up to their floor because we were thinking about a Los Angeles that had people even more isolated just staying in their cars, especially with COVID going right into their unit. So the core ended up being a sort of necessary development of the duality of both sides, i.e. the open side had to remain somewhat open in our minds because it had to accommodate purely for that sheer amount of cars. But I think it. I think there's a lot of possibility off of what you're saying uh, that the core could have sort of taken on a different role there. So I, I can definitely say that. I um, when I first saw the images of your project, which are um, beautiful, beautifully rendered, by the way, I thought, wow, this is great. It's somebody finally saved the building and didn't just tear everything down. <laughs> because one of the things that um, I think we're going to see in the future is that architects are not going to be designing things um, from, from a blank site anymore. I think it was ULI who said, it was probably five years ago, when they said um, 50 years in the future, architects are going to be, you know, the, the buildings were going to be creating have already been built. So we have to start thinking about our cities as infrastructure. And I thought the round building was the US bank tower that you just let decay and let's bomb out the windows and turn it into this like vertical garden, right? This kind of decaying beautiful skeleton structure and then build something next to it. So you're densifying it, but it, but it looks like you're doing something completely new. Um, so I wanted to talk about how I sort of feel like the uses of the project are kind of the same as what we're doing now. So you have a car park and we have car parks all over the place and you have a, an office side, which is a square floor plate. Um, and what's great about the way we used to design office buildings in the past when they were passive is that they all had very narrow floor plates and the buildings had light courts and it was because we didn't have air conditioning and you could get natural light and ventilation from both sides. So I'm always thinking about build, when I build new, I always think about very skinny thin buildings because that's how the future is gonna have to be. We can't have a lot of mechanical systems and we need thinner buildings. Um, and then I looked at the plan of the office side and it appears that you have a glass around the perimeter and the offices are cubicles that are on the perimeter. Um, and that your open office space is on the inside. And if you were to just flip that and put your um, cubicles or in, in the middle and more of your open space on the outside, you get a lot more natural light into your building. So we've actually renovated existing office buildings that have large floor plates like this. And what we've had to convince our clients of is that you shouldn't just have 10 um, offices, you know, the CEO and the COO who sit on the view side and everybody else just gets the shaft because they don't have a view or natural light, but you take those offices away from the outside of the skin of the building and you can even do it for a portion of it so that everyone who's in the open office space gets a view out, right? Or they get cross ventilation or something. And so you just kind of flip how you're sort of laying things out. Um, and then I, I also, I like the fact that you have two kind of different forms, but for me, what's really interesting about two different forms is more the space between the forms than actually the space within the forms. And so kind of how those forms interact with each other and what happens at that knuckle where they connect is really interesting to me. So, um, so I, I like your project, but I would like to just completely change the use of that round tower <laughs> into something else because cars are gonna be going away and we're gonna be doing something different. And the last thing I wanted to say about kind of the plinth idea, which I really like, if you look at the SOM building in downtown LA, which is a federal courthouse, um, which was a competition that we actually were competing against them on and we actually lost the job, they won the job, but they had figured out a great idea to lift all the courthouses up off the building. 
just the core goes down to the ground floor, but the ground is this sort of connecting public space that connects with the street. And it allows sort of this, uh, when there's protests in downtown LA, the protesters, if you've seen pictures of like the women's march, there's people all over the bottom of this building. And so some people think of a refuge or freedom as um, having space to do peaceful protests. And so I think the, the ground floor space below your plinth could be more could thought could be thought about as more of a space of the city, and rather than a place for people to go and be quiet, it's more of a place for people to actually communicate and be together, and um, you know have peaceful protests or or what have you. Um, so those are my comments. Maybe along those lines, um, I'm interested in the fact that. Um, on the one hand, you're saying, you know, we're going to pull the plinth up off of the ground to expose that back out to the city. And then on the other hand, you have um, this, that design of the refuge of this idea that public space would also require a place to just escape from other people and be alone. And I just thought that I think that is a really fascinating contradiction that you're saying. I, I think that's so important that that publicness could be defined in those somewhat, you know, supposedly contradictory ways. Um, and it just occurs to me too that you might want to think about, um, I think it was Margaret who said that um, in a way you have three ground planes, right? Um, and it might be fun to kind of just think about the very particular character of each ground and understand how, yes, and like one might allow for this big gathering of people, another might allow for escape and refuge, another might allow for a, a different kind of access or like a different access over time or something like that. Um, so I think what I'm maybe suggesting too is that I wouldn't want us to fall into a trap of saying that just because something becomes exposed, it's necessarily public, right? Or just because something has or does not have a plinth, it therefore has a kind of uh, you know inevitable meaning. And I think the meanings are themselves transformable, and they're kind of dependent on the way that you define your own kind of notion of public. So I, I think you're already doing that beautifully. Um, Thanks. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Julia. Hi. Hi. Um, question, what, do you have any views or images of what happens under that plan? Do we? It, we purposely left it very open. I think, I don't know, I can't claim that protests uh, where I do, I, I like that idea a lot. I think that makes a lot of sense to have it be this kind of like mass exodus opening space. It's purposely very free flow, very open. It's, it's basically blank because that site is already kind of slope slanted, uh, which you can see in the section here. Mm -hmm. But I think it was just, it was meant to be open to say, you have to come up to find the ground. You have to go into that plinth. Um, maybe engaging a little bit with what Jeanette was just saying of like, is it ever, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking of New York City parks where they're never really truly public anymore. I think that idea was to say, if you want to even see this building, you kind of have to, you have to engage with it. You have to go up because the ground condition is so blank in the first place. I think that was, that was the sort of idea. My other question is um, the, the, this garden skin that sort of peels off is there a rhyme or reason as to where it peels off and how much and yeah is so, it, so there's one peeling off area that has to do with separating your refuge right Jesse is that yeah so at the very top that's where um, those refuges are and then um, there's another place that happens right at the top of where it splits that's just more um, double height sky park um, but it peels off, kind of going off of kind of this like free flowing form just to allow, um, even though it's highly appropriated, to allow a lot more natural light to just come in through this center area. Um, and then also just have more of like this kind of dynamic seam between the way the facade interacts on this, where on, you get on the left side, it's just completely sealed off, mm -hmm. closed, and kind of this like perfect kind of boxy shape where this is really taking into the effect of it treating it more like a fabric that's not completely um, finished in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was also a little bit of like an anti-developer nod <laughs> to put 
to put the garden space where you would normally put the residences, you know, with, with the best views looking down the street. Um, it was, it was fairly purposeful to say, this is not necessarily, it's, it's a lower density, non-developer friendly tower in a lot of ways, because there's so much floor plate that is not being utilized to just maximize units in a lot of ways. Yeah, that was I mean, another I thing. I like your project a lot, mainly because I think it, 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 its greatest strength is that it's not elegant. You know, I think there's always a sort of, um, you know, in the history of skyscrapers to try to, they're either overdetermined or there's a search for a kind of elegance. And what I mean by that is, is kind of the stripped down kind of, um, you know, all the SOM sort of lineage of SOM uh, building curtain walls that sort of followed from the Mies curtain wall and, and his early fantasies that weren't curtain walls, but, you know, his early drawings at taller, um, you know, trans tra transparent, um, minimal. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's, it's squat, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of smushed and and these two things are kind of like not they don't know whether they like each other or not and they're sort of have bumped into each other um kind of uncomfortably i think the fact that you just have those two fingers basically connecting uh the two is kind of hilarious because it's like you you want it sort of that to me reinforces the 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 awkwardness but i think in a way it's a perfect um, resolution of the premise of the studio, which is to counter those prevailing, those prevailing images, right? It, 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 it's in its slight awkwardness, the bubblegum pink, the, um, you know, the, the, the shapes um, in relation to each other. Um, and yeah, and this, this awkwardness is what I find really uh, compelling. And I think a lot of has already been said about the plinth. Uh, I, I wonder this projecting onto the future that every building has this plinth that's plus four stories, you know, then the whole groundscape of Los Angeles becomes a giant flea market slash protest uh, kind of space. But um, yeah, so, so that's a, it's a sort of backhanded compliment. The compliment is that it's not, it's not elegant. And I like that. And I like that it's, it's, it um, sort of tells all these mixed messages and that it is uncomfortable at moments and counterintuitive and um, a, a waste of FAR and you know, all of those sort of things. And uh, I enjoy that. So congratulations. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse and Julia for uh, um, the compelling scheme. Uh, um, to me, it's full of ideas and uh, uh, you have made a tremendous effort to really bring them together in a synthetic uh, um, resolution. I uh, totally agree um, with the appreciation of the multiplication of the ground floor, so these three rounds. Um, I, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, in the in the argument of the of the actual ground floor, you could play up a little bit the argument of the the point of the shade. I mean, your plinth actually is going to project shade uh, on a substantial on a, a quite big lot, and shade is going to be um, a quite important theme for uh, and challenge for the cities of the future in that particular at that particular latitude. I mean, coming being operating in Brisbane, you know, we have this very urgent uh, uh, need to provide the city with shade. And I see in that plant uh, an extraordinary opportunity uh, to, um, to invent something and to foster uh, a new uh, agency of a sky rise in the city uh, in regard to this very uh, topic. So this is one thing that I have really enjoyed and, you know, might be played up uh, uh, more. The other thing that I, the other comment I wanted to uh, to make is that I really like the skin that you have uh, proposed, the skin of the building, of the, uh, of the round building. Um, I can't not think uh, of the uh, Oasia building by Waha in uh, Singapore, which I think you have uh, uh, looked at uh, and see. Um, of that building, what I really enjoy is the simplicity of the skin. It's a massive building, but yet it's, it's this mesh with uh, um, one vine. 
so the, the choice of materials is very minimal and yet the effect uh, because of the scale is so massive. So I was wondering if in, in your solution, um, you have not been too preoccupied to put too much on that skin, maybe just really considering carefully the kind of vine and, uh, and the mesh would have uh, been enough in a way to just provide that, uh, um, that final solution. But these are just details and you know more inputs for further thinking on a, on a very well resolved uh, scheme. Congratulations. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jesse and Julia, uh, for the beautiful presentation and for your enthusiasm all through the uh, semester. It was phenomenal to work with both of you. Um, and now we are going to close with the last project of the day. Um, Kyle, uh, I'm sure that there's going to be some uh, conversation on the project. Hi, everyone. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, so yes, like Alana said, my name is Kyle. Um, and for my project, um, I decided to look into and base my project around um, circulation and vertical circulation. So um, I'm naming my project The Conversation. Um, and the project um, is a sky rays that is lifted above the modern day automobile based urban fabric. Um, it is broken into two parts. Uh, one, the plinth, which is a city grid oriented uh, base and then the lifted freeform programmatic tower. Um, dealing within the current situations of uh, COVID and other social and political events, um, this project hopes to anticipate new futures uh, by pulling and revealing the core elements or the elevators to the exterior of the, the building and fusing it with the skin. Um, and that is an attempt to break down the inherent bottlenecks that are created through circulating a vertical piece of architecture um, and then separating the programs based on that fact. So looking at the programs of the uh, existing building, the US Bank Tower, and then my proposed building, um, you can see a large um, change in the vertical circulation and then the program distribution um, of different types. So. Obviously, the US Bank Tower has a heavy precedent on the office uh, program type. And I look to flip that on its head and uh, divide it up horizontally uh, between retail on the bottom, office occupying the middle, and then residential occupying the top um, of the tower. And then um, another thing that you can obviously see through this is the uh, prioritization of the, the vertical circulations. Um, and then as well as that, the, the structural bit that allows the building to fundamentally be lifted entirely from the, the plinth itself. In the elevation, um, you can see that the, the tower located within the dense uh, Los Angeles environment. Um, and it, the building aims to leverage its panelized facade system. Um, the, the system acts as a double facade, which obviously has inherent sustainability um, features um, through daylighting and um, through its heating characteristics, um, but it also attempts to act more of an aesthetic manner through the torsion of the skin away from the building itself and how it starts to cover up and reveal and conceal different moments of the vertical circulation, as well as starting to reflect the environment surrounding the tower, um, reappear, disappear, and really start to become the environment that it's settling within. In this section, um, you can see very clearly the distribution of the program um, cut horizontally and distributed vertically um, and how that starts to play out located above the plinth. So the plinth is divided onto three different levels. There's a 40 foot uh, separation between the lower end and the upper end. Um, and that's divided into two sections, which um, I'm proposing to be occupied through retail stores. Um, and then located below, um, is the parking, yet there is a sense of um, not allowing precedent and priority to be given to the car, um, rather peeling it away and giving the priority back to the, 
to the people and the ownership back to the people. And then getting into the plans, um, I've, I've drawn up four plans, uh, three main program types, as well as the parking. Um, and a large thing that I was looking into was the fact and the organization of the program within the change of the circulation. So there's within the move of pulling the circulation outwards, it has a lot of perpetuating effects on the, on the program within. So you can see within the parking plan, um, the circulation of the car within the, the vertical circulation then um, starts to revolve around the, the different undulating floor plates, um, adding into a very interesting way of actually being able to fit the allocated parking. Um, moving upwards, we can then see the retail on the right-hand side on the, the centrally located retail shops and then the, the open space on the floor plan around. And then continuing upwards, the office plan um, with its centralized core moments. And then I also wanted to include moments of where the floor plates can interact with each other vertically. So having opportunities for escalators or um, staircases where the, the bottom floor plate and the top floor plate can um, talk and converse with each other. And then at the top, um, within the residential plan, I was also looking into um, more of a luxurious um, apartment scheme where um, three and four bedroom uh, large scale apartments are located and then given amenities such as recreational spaces um, and large gathering spaces. And then I wanted to do more of a, uh, a lackadaisical flip book uh, showing the, the, um, the way that the, the facade system um, starts to interact with the different, um, the different vertical circulation. So flipping through the different floor plans, you can start to see how the, the facade starts to um, reveal, starts to fuse, and then starts to actually envelop the, the elevator cores and how then a, the, um, the interaction that that has within the rider will be very interesting and, um, and just like fun type of relationship. And then looking into the, the B and Alley crossroads, um, like Elena was um, introducing, um, I was looking into the above and below relationship with the, the, the plinth and the way that um, I am handling the, the ownership of the urban fabric and how people can start to actually begin to uh, interact with the building, um, the building ground condition rather than it being a car dominated um, system. And then um, as shown also in the section, the open green lobby floor plates offer a point in where the, the program and the vertical circulation can be disconnected and broken up where the, the bottlenecks that were being spoken of can also be uh, dissolved. Um, and then lastly, the case of safety and risk, um, the, the use in separating the circulation from the core and breaking people apart from each other offers a sense of safety with the uh, the impact that coronavirus has had, and then also looking forward to the or looking into the future, or trying to look into the future um, to try to mitigate anything that happens um, to us. Yeah, and then um, I forgot to show, but I do have trying to illustrate the um, the different conditions found in the crossroads. I also designed two trunks to start to look into those conditions at a little more of a, uh, a little more of a personal scale. So. Um, yes. What I appreciate about your project is uh, I appreciate the overall massing. Um, I, if you could go back to maybe one of your images of the massing in the city, um, uh, maybe something more illustrative. Uh, do you have like an axon? Well, I like the undulation in the envelope. Yeah, this one. I like very much the, the kind of skirt-like feeling of the facade uh, hanging off the, the, the kind of, um, um, I don't know, 
tree-like structure of the building. Um, I, 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 however, feel like the, the it, it's a bit of a missed opportunity to not occupy uh, out to the uh, envelope with, with actual spaces, right? Like the housing and the, and the offices. I, I feel like the place I wanna be in this building is right behind that facade. And that place I can, usually I'm not there. It's most of it is void or it's a kind of path where I get to somewhere else. But I, I, I think for my money, that is the place where you, you, you would wanna put all the spaces of the building is like out to that envelope um, and not make it so uh, detached. It, it's okay to feel detached. Like, like I think that, that feeling that you have created where that facade feels detached is, is actually really interesting, but I, I think it could on the contrary feel detached, but actually be attached through spaces where I would occupy it. Indoor spaces where I would get to be right at that envelope and be looking out. Um, and I think you would take more advantage of these kind of um, these undulations that you have in plan, those uh, return corners, you, you, you would get a lot out of that. Uh, you basically make a lot of corner windows essentially, right? Um, whether that's for a unit or it's for an office, I, I think the kind of multiplication of the corner in the massing strategy is really strong. Um, I, I do still wonder about the flatness of the top again, because we don't need to have hel hel helicopter pads anymore. And if you look at a uh, a map or like a, a satellite view of downtown LA, you'll see all the helicopter pads on every single skyscraper, uh, but uh, we don't need that anymore. So I, I feel like the articulation, like these undulations could have like, um, uh, uh, some could have come taller, some could have gone lower, I, I, or the, the surface of the envelope could have wrapped around. Like, I, I think the top is a missed opportunity, but I really, I think that the massing strategy is quite fascinating. And then the section, how you showed it fitting into the hill that it sits on, I thought that was also really well thought, thought about. And I think that um, developing a set of spaces, uh, instead, it's a kind of anti-plinth. The plinth like, uh, uh, it, it is not a plinth, it's really like setting those spaces of the ground level into the hillside. And I imagine a whole series of ways I can move from the lower part of the hill to the upper part of the hill. I almost imagine an opportunity to walk from the, the ground plane, like up through the place where the um, facade kind of cleaves away from the mass, that that gap could be really um, inhabited. Um, I'm also thinking that I, I, I'd really, really appreciate, again, the kind of translucency, the kind of like glitter openness of this building. I think it's really lovely, especially from the exterior 3D views. Um, but I'm super concerned that in the floor plans, the way that you've located the stair course really just breaks off almost all of your programs from light and air. And so I just wondered if you might have considered um, maybe rotating them to be perpendicular to the facade so that they're still kind of touching the perimeter, they're kind of pushing towards the outside as you originally intended, but you would allow a lot more kind of, um, yeah, just like flow between the perimeter and the interior. I think it's especially acute when you see the three the three bedroom apartment plan. Yeah, I would I would agree. It was um, originally the 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 service core uh, the four service cores were in an attempt to have the ability to lift the building from the ground plane, and so they were sized in accordance with that in mind, and then um, then filled with the service uh, programs, and then when starting to locate program within, it was definitely this um, kind of um, awakening moment where it was, it, it was difficult. And I do think that there could be more development with um, how they start to interact with the program within. And then maybe like you were saying, turning them or um, readapting them to facilitate in better ways. I'm gonna jump on that, um, on the comment of Margaret, cause I, I uh, I do think that you're building, if I could, I would chop the bottom and the top and it would be a beautiful object. <laughs> I think that you worked a lot in the central part, in the skin, in the way that it twists, in the way that the massing operate, but then the grounds, the way that the building touched the ground and the way that the building touched the skies are to me a little bit um, 
a waste opportunity or a, a missed opportunity, really, because they are just given, they are not interacting a lot. And I'm going to drop in the comment a project that I think it could be for you a good source of inspiration and 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 uh, and solutions, which is in Tesa San Paolo, Office Tower, um, of Enzo Piano in Turin. Uh, the program is in some way similar to your. There are offices and then there is some commercial and then there are public spaces at the ground floor and at the top. Now, what I like of your building is that you are uh, producing these humongous open space at the ground floor that at the moment is not um, is not used. It's just a gigantic height. It's not interacting with uh, the way that the sloped ground uh, um, is creating a hill on the side, is not operating or interacting with the skin of the tower. And I think that what Renzo Piano does is interesting because it's still maintaining this gigantic um, empty space, but is grounding it with some public function. Similarly, the roof. I think that your roof uh, at the moment is for sure flat, it's not necessary, the skin is stopping. But I, I do believe that it will be a beautiful moment when this predominant element of your, of your aesthetic language, which is the skin, could start behaving differently and could start operating for uh, either the residential function or a commercial slash public function in a different way. Now, clearly we don't want to have a hat on the building, but the idea that the roof is simply one last slab and that's it, I don't think is sufficient at this point, um, in particular with your skin, because these beautiful volumes that they're producing are just being chopped. And, and the contrast, and that's why I think that your middle part is extremely efficient, because I see the moment where the scheme and the function, they start working together, which is to me extremely appealing. And when they start delaminating and simply being um, and terminating without a precise uh, design solution, I, I, I don't see the architect anymore. I just see the function terminating its role. So those, if I could, or if you could work on them in the future, those would be to me the era where you could really tune in your project and and again the scheme is fantastic i think the scale of the of the panels is a little bit big which makes the building a little bit small but besides that i do believe that it's looking very good and the production was great so thank you so much thank you yeah i totally agree with all your comments hi kyle hey you guys man. how are you <laughs> nice to see you again yes. uh it I agree that it that uh, I could imagine this going on and on at the top, but it's sort of just um, truncated. It seems to um, seem unfinished, but then I could also see how you could make an argument for that. Um, talking about, uh, again, going back to this sort of talking architecture thing, I think the story that you tell about that, can you go back to the plans, the Typical floor plan, right? So these cores, these um, core slash stairs that then create these kind of hideous, kind of concrete things, right? You know, like you push it, you know, why are they hidden, right? I mean, if the story is that these guys are really um, kind of anchoring the four corners of the structure, then I wouldn't expect them to just sort of modestly sit slightly behind, you know, this, this this uh, the paneling, right? Because you've you've opened up the paneling to allow for those moments, right? The four corners, so that's where the skin opens up. And I just wonder if they were reoriented. So instead of their instead of being parallel to the to the ground plane, they're actually flipped and perpendicular. Um, and that they really express themselves urbanistically, right? At the urban scale, then you it's always identified as these four kind of brutalist moments um you know that that are broken free from from this this skin right and i think right now it's it's a little bit uh it's a little bit timid and i think if you're going to make that argument and fine do it uh, make it even bigger and bolder you know and 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 turn the configuration of them i also agree that i think and you know this is in a number of projects have had this kind of um, delaminated um, skin. I would just repeat what I said earlier, which is that is it autonomous? Does it want to speak as autonomous or does it want to speak as something that 
um, was uh, part of it that got delaminated, right? So that it, it, it performs in different ways. Uh, those two it, it give you different results. And I think it's, it's still unclear as to whether it wants to be a, a kind of an autonomous thing uh, that says screw you to anything behind it, in which case that it wouldn't perform also at the same angles, right? So it wouldn't have the same footprint. It would really have an independent kind of um, envelope. Um, or that it is kind of, a, you know, it, part of it and it just sort of broke free at certain moments. And I think right now it's, it's neither. Um, but I also like, again, the sort of the, the it's slightly clunky um, and uh, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy the fact that it's sort of, it's sort of a screw you again to the FAR question, right? And it's, and this lack of optimization you could see it as a problem, like this is all that void, all that white stuff, right, in your plan. Um, I think you could push it even further in the in the in the residential areas where I think you have a basketball court and you have some other leisure, kind of yes, this plan. So what happens in those in the three other areas? The number twos, dining, right? I mean, those are those are huge dining spaces, right? And so I think again, it's like you know if those are the public spaces and they happen to have the circulation on either side of them, you know, make them maybe a little bit more visible, push those spaces out as you push out the sort of, and perpendic make perpendicular those, those circulation zones. Again, I think it's, it speaks to kind of changes and transitions in the project that could be interesting. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, um, I was just going to add on to what Jasmine was saying about these cores that are on the outside of your building, because I think there's this huge tension between them and this kind of light sparkly facade that you designed. Um, and maybe it's that you need to just think about these stairs as this concrete structure, right, that holds up your building and that you expand it across maybe the whole building and your, your sparkly facade goes outside of them. Because um, when you look at your plan, you have these switchback stairs that are all the same on every single floor. And that is what architects hate, right? We generally get uh, developers who tell us, don't do anything special with the stairs. We're gonna shove them in a shaft and they're gonna be these little rectangular dead spaces with no natural light. And that kills us, right? So what you've done is just taken those little rectangular spaces and put them on the outside of your building. But no one says that you have to circulate that way. There's no one who says you can't actually go from one floor on a continuous run to your next floor and then go from that floor on a continuous run to your next floor. And there's no one who says you can't have a ramp, right? That you circulate from one level to the other. And so maybe the space between this exterior skin and the slab of your building, which we've also been talking about, becomes these spaces of circulation so that you can go from one level to another, but then also be in this space. Maybe it's a public space, maybe it's an amenity space, or it's more of a special kind of place between the skin and the uh, floors of your building. Um, that was one thing. And then I wanted to just, if this is the third, this is the last, I think, of the three that we're talking about, right, Elena? Yes. Okay, yep. I just wanted to kind of talk about uh, the three that we've seen. Um, and just kind of maybe encourage you to think more about the uses um, in the same way that you guys are thinking about the exterior form of the building. Because I think um, some of the forms are really radical and the materials are really radical and you're really thinking kind of outside the box on, on that side of things. But then when I look at the spaces and, and plan and kind of the uses of the residential versus retail versus office, they seem to be very traditional. And so I would encourage you to just blow through that and do something completely different. Do something we've never seen before. You know, um, when I heard you say, I think you said you wanted to make luxurious three and four bedroom apartments up here. Um, you know, who's gonna rent those? I mean, we have empty expensive apartments in downtown LA that nobody lives in right now. And we have 70,000 homeless people on the streets. And so one of the things that that they, they slightly look defensive to me, all three of them, like you guys are retreating a little bit from the city when I would, when I would want it to be more about linking to the city 
and maybe providing space, you know, how are we going to provide space for the people who live on the sidewalks of downtown LA, for instance, if you go down there now, I mean, I've lived here for 30 years and in the last five years, it's been amazing. The amount of people, we almost have slums now in this country in downtown LA um, and it boggles the mind. So I, I think we have to stop doing kind of what we've traditionally been doing, which is retail office housing, luxury housing, you know, and think about how to, blow up kind of this social stratification. And maybe it goes back to how we look at spaces, which is um, someone mentioned shade and trees. And you can tell the um, income level of a neighborhood by how much shade and how many trees are there, right? So if you were to say, my building is all about trees, it's one big tree or it's shade or something, you know, it kind of speaks to this. So, and, and it provides housing for homeless people at the plinth, right? Because you have a big plinth. It's super big and it's a little flat. I wanted to ask you about maybe why your plinth was flat, but there's all this space. Maybe we provide housing for people who don't have houses, you know? So I would encourage you guys to think a little bit about that. Um, and another thing, uh, I don't, the statistics of retail space and office space, retail, New York retail rents have dropped like 13% in 2020. And what people really crave is this idea of kind of small main street retail storefronts and they order everything online. So nobody's going to the mall anymore. You know, we have a big mall here in Hawthorne that's actually completely empty. Um, so how we think about kind of reusing buildings and adaptive reuse and maybe rethinking retail, you know, so maybe the retail isn't a piece of the building between the sixth and the 10th floor, but maybe the retail is on the ground and it's just right on the sidewalk edge maybe. And it's little tiny spaces that are more about people and about how your building meets the street rather than just providing kind of that retail space. Hi, maybe, hi Kyle, I'll just uh, give a reading that I have of your, of your project. Um, in my, in, in my opinion, and I don't know if I'm misreading this, but it's, a, it's more an exercise of typologies. And uh, I, I, I take it back, uh, and maybe just because I'm here, to Hong Kong. And I think there's every typology of tower in Hong Kong that you can possibly imagine. And I see your, uh, your exercise in, in the fact that you've taken two kind of iconic typologies, the uh, IMP Bank of China, which is this very angular kind of building, and then Norman Foster's um, HSBC Bank, which kind of does exactly what you're doing, takes the services and the cores to the exterior. And then you kind of like then play with this idea of these two typologies. And what, in my opinion, you're trying to do, but maybe sometimes don't say it, is that you're trying to inhabit that, um, uh, that facade, that skin, that edge in, in, in different ways. And to me, it, the, the kind of, Example, if you could go to the plan, one of your plans, you actually put some elevators into the facade. And that's to me the success of your project is, is when you inhabit uh, the facade. And my question is why can't those elevators be actually inside the facade? So that the whole facade is like people are saying could be environmentally um, designed, but could also be programmatically designed. You inhabit the wall, you inhabit this edge condition. And then I think, apart from the fact that I really enjoy the energy of your project, I think it could be very radical. It, 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 a structure is not just a space frame, but it's actually a space that we can live, animals could live, you know, whole, the whole fauna, whole habitat could happen inside that um, inhabited wall. But I enjoyed your project very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to add a, a final note uh, um, and keep talking about the scheme, which is, uh, uh, a very big gesture in your project. And I was thinking that because you have chosen this module, um, I was wondering why didn't you think of, uh, com you know, using solar panels and uh, thinking on a, of an integrated system where the solar panel actually is not just a device to collect energy, but also a design uh, solution for your facade. Uh, in such a way, you could transform uh, and turn this building into um, a, an energy efficient machine uh, that uh, can become completely or, or, or mostly self, self sufficient. Uh, in a period of climate change, where you know we necessarily need to step up and uh, uh, take agency in this uh, direction. Yeah, I think that's an interesting, um, an interesting thought, and I. 
I totally agree. I think it, it, it is kind of a missed opportunity on my behalf. Um, something that I was extremely interested in about the materiality was the, the transparency versus opaqueness that comes through reflection. And so um, within the, the elevation points of transparency um, as in the middle or the, the center um, in between the two vertical circulations. And then almost this point of opaqueness that happens across the sheen. Um, and so I was, I guess, more focused on that within my mindset, but I do think that is, it's a great opportunity. Um, I'm blanking on the name. There's a project in Copenhagen it's a school that they actually completely clouded in solar panels. Um, and it's, and it's like this teal and it, this teal look and it's, it like reflects light in interesting ways. However, it's not, um, I don't think that they're windows per se. Um, so I think, I think that would be a super interesting present to look forward in though. Thank you, Kyle, uh, for sharing your project. Maybe now we are at the moment for the final remarks. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank the jury for being here to see these three projects and uh, also mention again that um, Peter, uh, Jeanette, and Sylvia are doing actually the same project, I meaning not the same topic, but they're also engaged with the um, Biennale. With the, um, maybe it would be interesting if you just can say what you guys are doing. I mean, just a few words, it doesn't have to be very long, but just to, part of curiosity know uh, how you guys are taking on this theme of the Biennale. Thank you for asking, Eleanor. We are very excited. We are working on it right now. And uh, we are tackling the problem from a completely different scale. So you, we're looking at the, at the house um, as, a, as a dimension being Australian city is very sprawled and, uh, you know, and vast uh, and uh, based on the private property. So we are working on, uh, on, the, on the residential typology. Thank you. And Peter? Uh, yeah, we, we're uh, kind of taking um, something similar to yours because we're in the same context in terms of a, a very dense vertical um, urban context, but we're taking the opposite approach that we're going to a place where there is no density in Hong Kong. So the paradox is that we're looking at villages in Hong Kong and seeing how these villages could kind of become useful as a, as a space that you can inhabit when you know the density is so high here so we're, we're looking at the kind of the rural hong kong which seems a, like a paradox but that's what we're looking at thank you villages in hong kong i haven't been so I, maybe i need to come to hong kong again i've seen all this skyscraper Jenna. definitely definitely It'd be nice to have you yeah thanks for asking i really the, the thought that we could all be be in Seoul together makes me very happy so i hope we get to see each other there um, my studio is called Property in Crisis, so I guess we're mostly focused on the crisis angle of the soul um, topic. And uh, it's Property in Crisis because um, we're looking for ways in which property can try to help um, build um, uh, racial equity and social justice in West Oakland in a way that can better um, kind of supply residents there to tackle some of the threats of, you know, COVID, um, uh, housing crisis, uh, sea level rise questions that maybe property could give people the ability to kind of share resources and kind of adapt to some of those pressing changes. Thank you, Janet. And, and I also would like to thank you, maybe open if you guys have any uh, final feedback to uh, Margaret, Jasmine, Angela, and Andrea. They are joining us from SIAR. Angela, I'm saying from SIAR, you're an alumni. So to me, you are, you're, you're part of the family. And by the way, thank you for the incredible feedback. Uh, I, was, I was texting with Nancy. It's like, <laughs> In the room. <laughs> you guys have done a fantastic job talking about- It was a long time ago, but Margaret, Maybe Margaret was before, after me, before me. I don't remember. <laughs> it was too long ago, 1991. Graduated what? from SciArc. When I graduated from SciArc. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't there. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I never went to SciArc, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, I don't even remember. Too long oh. ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just teach there now, but. Um, and I don't know. I've been teaching there for about 16 years, but. Yeah. Um, uh, it's great to see the work and I, I, I think it's a super interesting topic to look at density, um, to look at it in that part of the city um, and um, 
I think that uh, it, 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 what I appreciated was um, the kind of holistic view that you guys took, like really representing well uh, your projects in relation to the context, uh, which I do think many times we think of a tower or skyscraper as being like uh, an iconic uh, uh, individual situation. But I think in a place like downtown LA, it, it, there's quite a context for it. And I think it really matters its relationship to the other tower. So I, I appreciated uh, that you guys were all thinking about that and looking at that relationship to the rest of the city. Um, yeah, and I wanted to just congratulate you for uh, being invited to participate in the, in the Biennale. Um, and it's funny because I read through the brief before I uh, listened to the projects and I thought I was gonna see some short buildings, <laughs> you know, because it was anti-tall building and, you know, um, and your, the buildings I saw were huge. So um, they're city buildings, you know, um, but I really appreciate the fact that this class at the studio is thinking about the form of our cities. And I just would encourage you to be more radical in how you think about how we live and work and the spaces in which we live and work um, in the same way that you think about the form of the buildings, um, because uh, that's really kind of the future. And I see, I mean, it's terrible to say that I think this pandemic um, is providing us with an opportunity as a society to completely change the way we think about the way we live and work in cities. And so that is gonna happen. And um, I encourage you to think more radically. Yeah, I, I cannot agree more. I mean, I thought, uh, uh, apart from everything that we are going through in general as a social uprising, I think if there is something we can do is be an architect right now. At least we know how to do that. And then we should do that uh, as, as a base <laughs> for our contribution to society. So I, I thought as architects, we understand topology and we understand form and we understand how to change a floor plan. So I couldn't agree more that uh, we should operate in the realm in which we're experts. Um, Jasmine, I see that you are unmuting yourself, so I'm thinking there will be a comment. No, I think, look, I think, um, you know, the ability to, to have the opportunity to work on, uh, and if we imagine that these would get built, I mean, working on the, the br project brief of a tall building is particularly luxurious in the sense that it's one of the few, it is besides other civic buildings, it's, it's a chance for um, architecture to really be in dialogue with the city at the scale of the urban. Um, and so those opportunities um, also put pressure on the building to give back, right? And so it, it's not actually just about um, the people who live in it and work in it, but it's about what it provides uh, all the other people uh, around it, who walk around it, who walk under it, who look at it out from their office windows. And I think that that's a, that's a, it's a privilege and a burden uh, to take on those kinds of projects. And I think that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make a tower interesting in my perspective. It's sort of like the housing problem. You know, how do you make housing interesting? Uh, you know, it's a challenge because it is about repetition. Um, it is about, uh, uh, you know, sameness and how do you get away from the sort of the floor and the slab and uh, so on and so forth. And I think that just, I, I also just, and maybe it's totally politically incorrect, but this lack of efficiency, this you know, too much space given, I mean, you know, Silverstein would never want to put a retail space in your buildings, right? Because he would just say, you know, we're not getting a bang for our buck, right? Per square foot, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's good in a kind of, in a, in a perverse way. I think there's the burden, we have such a burden on us uh, to take, to take heed of all the problems that the world is, is throwing at us. And maybe it's okay to be irreverent once in a while. And I think that if we're irreverent with our overscaled uh, sense of, of, of uh, luxury and uh, you know this sort of the impossibility of some of the proposals that we don't even get into, 
that that's okay. You know, like it, we're in school, you guys are in school and you can dream a little bit. And uh, later on, you have the rest of your lives to consider how you're going to be uh, more efficient with your, with your tall buildings. But um, I enjoyed the project, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. So Andrea, are you closing with um, with a cheers for the students? I close with a cheers. Well, for sure, congratulations to everybody. It was an incredibly exciting semester and I had the chance to see you all in the midterm and now back here. And it's to me fantastic to have the chance to do it. So thank you to Eden and Kumaran for inviting me. And, and, and I really um, think what you did was working with hierarchies and structures of power and working with a typology that is so not democratic and looking for new ways to produce democracy through your systems and your new forms of structures that you are producing, structures of power, freeing the ground, freeing the roof, creating balconies, facades that are talking to the public more than I'm talking to the people living inside the building is a fascinating, a fascinating exploration and also a very challenging one. So congratulations for all the amazing work and I cannot wait to see you again next semester. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody that is watching us on uh, YouTube live. And thank you to the students who I would like to invite to go to our private Zoom for um, our um, final virtual drinks. And thank you again to all the jurors for your wisdom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye